might as well get started. Uh, can uh, can folks online hear me OK? Uh, yeah, I can hear you just fine. OK, excellent. Thank you very much. All right, and I'm going to turn my volume up so I can hear you a little bit better. All right, can I get one more sound check, please? Hi, we can hear you just fine. Perfect, you thank you. OK, um, so everybody, welcome to the uh, our 2021 uh, staking workshop. Um, so uh, introductions first, my name is Tim Schilling. Um, I manage the competitive land sales programs uh, project development team. So uh, my staff and I are the ones responsible for authorizing the, the land sale projects, such as the remote recreational capital sites um, areas that we've offered this year. Um, and then uh, also here is Justin. That's all the introduction you, you get. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm actually uh, the Black Bay Instruction. Um, I'm kind of uh, at the, the front of the um, charge of free land offerings. Um, one of those uh, land offerings is Cabin Site. And uh, probably the internal lease application. I'm already working with that to get uh, that stuff. Yeah, any questions you have, let us know. Contact us with us at the uh, state state resource. Um, Thank you. Um, and for for those folks who didn't uh, for attending from home who didn't uh, hear before, we're going to be recording this conversation or this uh, this staking presentation. Um, so it's going to be available hopefully uh, later. Uh, it will be available online. So uh, if you'd like to refer back to it or for other folks who are unable to attend presently. Alright, so uh, we've got a few things that we're going to cover here today. Uh, we've got the uh, we've got a presentation uh, or the, the this entire presentation is going to be probably about two and a half hours long, two hours long um, for the bulk of the material that we're going to cover about the general information. So there we're going to go over the staking, uh, sorry, the individual uh, staking areas. So we're going to cover um, a little bit about the program, how to stake a parcel, what you do, uh, sort of the leasing, turning your lease application, everything that we're going to expect. You to turn in to be successful on the parcel because that's ultimately what this is about. This is we want you to be successful in staking your parcel. Um, so while you're here, it's a great opportunity. It sounds like we've got you know folks from we've got a couple folks from Pro, uh, from uh, Mount Ridge, we've got uh, Silverbow, we've got Alma Lakes, um, and there's there's folks online. This is a great opportunity when there's you know, more folks here to kind of meet other folks who are staking in the area. Um, it's you know an opportunity maybe to kind of share some work for travel home you know, about something like that. So. Uh, you know, if anybody wants to share information from online or presently, good opportunity. Um, all right, so so thanks for being here. Um, a little bit about the program. Uh, I'll start out there. So uh, everybody's gotten this far, so you probably know more or less what the program is about. But um, just a little bit of background. We've had uh, since statehood, since 1959, we've had you know various different lands of programs, and through that we've had a handful of different state for self programs similar to the remote rec uh, program. So there was the old. Home staking program, uh, various iterations of the home site program, open to entry areas, things like that. Some of these other programs had different requirements than this one. So um, up until 2000, when this program was created, uh, many of those other programs had a prove up requirement. So you could go out and you know, select your own piece of land, stake it, and apply for a purchase of that. But you had to uh, construct a structure on that land and occupy that structure within a certain period of time in order to get title. This program doesn't have any. And so the, the big thing to know is with this, we don't have any uh, post tab restrictions. So when you purchase the land, it's sold fee simple for the uh, surface state. So that means you can do with it or not. I mean, you don't have to build a cabin, you don't have to occupy it. Um, and then we don't control any of the use once it's sold. So uh, the, if it's within a borough, uh, which the only one that's within a borough right now is on the lakes. Um, so in the future, they might exercise zoning or taxation authority, but they're not currently. Um, all right. So. Uh, in order to stake a parcel, you have to be able to wear, and so that's how all of you folks are, are here because you're uh, winners or losers. Uh, yeah, looks like everybody here is winners. Uh, there might be some alternates online. I'm not sure, um, but uh, so in order to be able to stake a parcel, you have to, to win the authorization in the drawing. Um, and then uh, so you stake your parcel, and then you lease it for three years while you survey and appraise it. One of the big changes between this program and what we had in the past is in those other programs, they oftentimes required the staker to. Uh, contract for their own survey to have the survey, and it was oftentimes cost prohibitive. 
So it's very expensive to survey a single piece of uh, land in a very remote uh, location. Additionally, sometimes folks had issues with getting their surveyor to uh, perform, so they'd pay the surveyor and the surveyor would just never really got around to it. So now at the end of the staking period, we'll cover how this works a little bit later, but at the end of the staking period, we take all the parcels within that particular staking area. Everybody goes into lease at the same time and then we contract for the survey of all the parcels at once. And so that uh, it gives a much reduced survey cost prorated over all of the parcels. So it's much more successful. Um, and then ultimately once you survey and phrase, you have the opportunity. So a little bit about, about us. Uh, so you already met me. I'm located up in Burbanks. Um, I'm down here for uh, for the staking workshops and uh, other administrative stuff this week. But uh, throughout the course, especially if you're going to be coming through the Burbanks area uh, for Silver Bowl or Alba Lake, stop in and say hi. You can check in and uh, you know let us know what you're thinking about doing. It's great. We'll talk about some of that later. Um, but uh, so Justin uh, here in the Anchorage office and uh, Brandon and Leah. Uh, so they're the ones who you're probably going to be working most of the time with throughout this process. So by the, from the time that you and start staking if you have questions you'll probably contact them um, and, uh, and then once you submit your lease application it's going to be going through them and one of them will contact you if you have questions or if you make any modifications to any additional information um, so all of our contact information is going to be located in the staking instructions uh, page there and uh, but I guess I don't know which page it's on but um, it's in the staking instructions it's also online uh, you can reach us at that dnr.rcs email um, additionally, you can just you can call us by phone. Uh, we're you know, generally available 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, with that said, you know we understand that some people with you know work you know and everything else sometimes those hours don't really work for you. Um, you know if you need to you know come in on the weekend or after hours or something like that, give us a call. We'll probably set up an appointment to make something happen. So you know we want to be here available for you. Um, Public Information Center um, is where you're probably going to be dealing with some of the stuff over the years for you know making payments and such. Uh, they're open from uh, 8 a.m. to 4:30. They have their office here in Anchorage, also one in Fairbanks. Um, and uh, they're closed, I think, the first Wednesday of the month, uh, just in the morning, some training. But other than that, they're available for maybe up to So, uh, also in the staking instructions, there's going to be a lot of links to other resources, uh, which we're going to cover in some some detail here. So, this is the uh, this is the uh, stakers page. So, when you received your authorization via email, there would have been a URL to this page attached, a link uh, to to this page. This is not available via the regular website, so there's not any way to where you can kind of follow links to this website. Uh, so you're going to have to specifically type in that URL to get to it. Uh, the reason that we have it uh, kind of super secret hit anyway is we don't want there. It's a kind of a big inside joke about our SQL page. Um, but the reason we don't have it generally available to the public is we just don't want the public stumbling across this and uh, being misinformed and thinking that they can just go out and stake a parcel without an authorization. Right? Um, so it's only available to authorized stakers and alternates for that purpose. So uh, we'll go through the web page here a little bit. This is you know, generally the kind of general overview of it, but there's going to be a lot of uh, general information. So the first part of the page there is links to the, the general staking instructions and information that applies to all of the areas. Um, then from there, we're going to have our three separate staking areas, and these are going to apply all the information here is just going to apply to that individual area. So all the lakes, Mount Ridge, Division, and Silver Lake. Um, so select the one that you're authorized uh, a staker for and kind of go through some of the information that's on there. Um, so uh, the biggest thing probably that you're going to want to keep checking back in on is going to be the staking map. So as folks go out there and they stake a parcel, uh, we try to be you know, pretty quick about getting that parcel into GIS and getting that map updated and posted on the web. So before you go out and stake, it's a good idea to check that map and see what parcel might be out there. Um, so for the folks that are here and folks online, is anybody planning on heading right out and staking uh, this month in a way right away when it opens? Okay, okay. So it looks like we got got a couple of folks in the last meeting. Sound like nobody, you know, folks probably gonna wait until spring or even later to go out. Um, but I mean, it was just fine anyway. Um, so um, if you're if you're heading right out, we're not gonna have any updated information, obviously, because there is no staking on it. Um, if you're waiting until a little bit later, you know, by all means, uh, you know, check out the staking map or you know, better yet, just give us a call and ask us if there's anything out there. You might have some parcel stake. Hello, welcome. Uh, if you wouldn't mind signing in for me, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, give us a call and see if there's any parcels that are uh, that might be out there that might not show up on, on the staking map. Um, likewise, and we'll cover this a little bit later, if you start staking and don't finish it, like within that first weekend, if you call us up and let us know about where it's at, that's great. That's great information. We can... If somebody's thinking about staking an area and they call up and say, hey, what's, you know, what's not showing up on the staking map? You can say, well, we know that there's somebody out in this general area, so you know, be aware of the way that you might run into the flag down there and not open it. 
kinds of things. So check back on the staking. Um, additionally, there's the uh, boundary coordinate diagram and survey key. And so this is specific to each area. And so this has individual coordinates that, that outline the boundary so you can make sure that you're staking within the area. So you absolutely positively have to be within the staking area for us to get parcel. Um, there, in some areas, we have uh, coordinates for where there's uh, specific reserved areas, staking setbacks, things like that. So you can make sure that you're staying outside of those on there as well. Um, and you might want to check back up before you go out just to make sure there's not any changes uh, to those. Uh, they're going to be updated just because there's a lot of significant digits to those uh, to those coordinates that we have on there now. So we're going to be kind of contracting those a little bit later. And I think we have one update from out there uh, just for that reserved area. Um, and then at the end of, uh, of all these, there's going to be a link to the base appraisal uh, on here. So the um, the base appraisal has already been completed for these. So ultimately, once you stake your parcel, uh, so in the, the offering brochure, it had a there was the key parcels for how much a parcel is likely to cost based on size and the attributes. So primarily access, whether it's right up on a trail, right up on a full plain festival lake, right up on a river, something like that, um, or interior. Um, so that base appraisal has already been completed. You can actually you can go to that and look and see it with that base appraisal. Uh, the information about the hypothetical key parcels is already in the brochure, and it's uh, um, it's going to also be in your supplemental staking instructions as well. All right, so we'll cover uh, each of these um, in a little bit more detail. So for this first segment uh, here, we're going to be talking about getting ready before you go out in the field. So getting all your information uh, together, uh, attending a workshop. You guys are here. That's great. Uh, great way to get prepared. Um, and then we're going to be, um, uh, we're kind of, yeah, we're going to go through everything before you ever go out. So, uh, so we're going to just kind of hop right into that. So, um, well, and then after that, we're going to go, go into how to stake a parcel and then once you actually get up. So, uh, does anybody have any questions about the website or anything we've covered this month? I'm going to be checking back in periodically just to make sure everybody's on. Okay. So the first step is uh, read and study that staking packet. So that staking packet is that those materials on that staker's web page, which includes pr primarily your, uh, it's going to be the, the general survey instructions, the, the, uh, the checklist, the lease application. So that way you know what's going to be expected of you on the field. And we're going to cover that in some detail. All right, so this is the contents of this. I'm not going to go through it. We're going to actually get up going through most of these in detail. Uh, the authorization letter, you can forget that. That was a typo. I should have pulled that out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the rest of these, this constitutes what we refer to as the staking packet. So that's all that information, general information, as well as the area specific stuff. Uh, so the first one is going to be the general staking uh, instruction. So it's a pretty lengthy document. So, you know, grab your favorite beverage and sit down and just take the time over a day or two to, to go through this. Make sure you understand what it is. Uh, depending on where you're staking, if you have an idea uh, that you're going to be staking right up on a floor plane accessible lake, you know, right up on a trail, something like that, I, study that that for that particular information make sure you know what all the requirements are so for instance um if they're if you're staking up and i'm just going to pick on the non participation folks here um so there's various setbacks from either the river uh, and also the trails within the area so if the setback you either have to be right here the parcel has to be right up adjacent to that setback or you have to be three away from that setback so if it's a 200 foot setback your parcel has to be 200 feet from that river let's say you know or you have to be 530 feet away from um, incidentally, the reason for that uh, for that rule is that we want, you know, so that the, typically the highest value land is going to be that stuff that's right up on the trail, right up on the river, right up on the land. Yeah. So we want to make sure that there's adequate amount of space for somebody else to fit another. If somebody doesn't want to be right up to it, there's still an adequate amount of space for somebody who does want to stay the parcel and want to pay that extra cost at that higher number. So, um, anyway, so study those study those staking instructions. Uh, there's a list of our, there's uh, multiple different links in here to some great resources. We're going to be covering some of these. At the end, we're going to be covering the Blast the Mapper, and we might delve into some other resources that are they're pretty good resources for uh, inspecting the area before you go out. Um, there's going to be a lot of examples, specifically the examples of how to fill out a sketch plat is going to be really good. It uh, kind of walks you through that, that process. Um, and then it you know, walks you through kind of figuring out how big your parcel is and kind of what to expect during that lease period uh, for payments and other things. So the supplemental staking instructions are going to be the ones that are specific to your area. So this is going to line out all of those very specific uh, building setbacks, um, the reserved areas, uh, things like that. So the place that you cannot stake or if there's certain requirements. In this offering, uh, you know, all of the areas that we have, it's a minimum of five acres maximum of 20. Um, in this offering, we don't have any 
specific water frontage restrictions other than the general 33% water frontage. It means that only 33% of your, uh, the perimeter of your parcel can be along the water frontage. And we'll cover that for the court. Um, but, uh, but so if there's anything specific like that that applies to your area only, that's going to be in this uh, the area specific state constrictions. All right. Uh, it's going to list all the known public water bodies within the area. Um, and then there's going to be, if we have any information that's updated about this, that's a good idea to check back into this because we might end up updating this one. But this is also going to have specific information about your base appraisal. So how much, if you're trying to figure out kind of how much you might be paying for a 10 acre parcel versus a 20 acre parcel, or if you stake it on a lake versus a river, something like that, this is the information we're going to give in finance. So, uh, there we go. All right, uh, the staking checklist. It's it's just that. It's a checklist. Um, so uh, we're gonna. Uh, I'm probably, you're gonna hear me hammer on this throughout the uh, throughout this presentation. But uh, bring a copy of the staking instructions with you. Bring a copy of the lease application with you, and bring a copy of the checklist with you into the field. Right. Print it out. Bring it with you. This is a great tool to use to ha to help you get all the collect all the information you're gonna need to bring out to the field with you before you go out in the field. Um, and then once you're out in the field, collect all the information that's on here. If you have that lease application with you, it's basically a fill in the blank meets and bounds uh, description of your parcel. And it has described everything, all of your corners, uh, you know, your, your distances, directions, all that, describe your photographs. It's a great place to take notes anyway. So I'm gonna, that's my first plug. You're gonna hear it a couple other times. But uh, walk through the checklist, make sure you understand what's on there. Uh, you have a staking map. Um, it's not too terribly much to it. It shows the boundary of the area, uh, shows the topography. Uh, there's two things to note on here. One, this shows the declination, which we cover when we're talking about getting your azimuth for your for your boundaries. Um, the other thing is uh, we're going to ask you when you turn in your lease application, just print this out and draw your parcel on here. So we have an idea generically within the broad area of the staking area where your parcel is going to be. Um, all right. So the boundary coordinate diagram, we covered that a little bit. This is uh, this has all the you know the coordinates for the various locations on here. This also has for folks who are staking in um, in Alma Lakes and um, in uh, Belt Ridge Edition, this is going to have the location of monuments on here. Um, so the uh, so the ones that look like the little BMW symbols there are going to be a uh, Alaska State Land Survey primary monument, which we'll show you. That's going to be this large aluminum cap monument here. We'll show you that when we get into reference points. Uh, the ones that are, what's the name of that cross? This came up in the other. Oh God, figured it out when we were. Yeah, the, meeting that I forgot. The, 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 the Maltese cross. Thank you. I, I kept wanting to call it a uh, Celtic cross, but the ones that look like the Maltese cross there, those are going to be uh, uh, BLM monuments. So those are going to be a little bit smaller brass cap monuments. Uh, is what you're looking for. So that that's going to come into play when you're looking for finding a reference point. Um, also, if you're in one of these areas uh, that has private property in there, which is going to be Mount Ridge Edition in the northern portion of Alma Lakes, uh, where there's existing private property. Uh, so this will help you locate that property to make sure that you are staying on state land, not staying into some private property uh, for one, or, you know, so you can locate it if you want to be a little bit more distant away from it. Um, this in conjunction with that, uh, the, the area specific information uh, on there, there are we have survey plats for these survey parcels in that um, on that very specific page. So uh, those the state those survey plats you can pull them up. Many times those survey plats have coordinates for the uh, for monuments of those parcels. So that's a, it's a great way you can plug those in before you go out in the field to navigate to the area or just make sure you're not getting too close to like that, depending on what you know what your desire is. A couple things to note about this is that uh, so first off the uh, coordinate system on this one is going to be in NAD83 uh, data. So we'll get into GPS settings and such a little bit uh, a, a little bit later, but just for right now, the coordinate system is going to matter, right? So whatever you are inputting coordinates into your GPS, you need to make sure that you know, the data that you're inputting the coordinate in is the same as your set settings on your GPS, or you just change the setting on your GPS before you put. Uh, and then you can always change back to whatever it's automatically going to recalculate whatever that, that coordinate system is. Um, so if uh, to that end, if you know, if folks, if you have a GPS, you know, before you go out the field, whatever you can bring the GPS in, most of us are pretty savvy about using the GPS. Bring it in, and it will help you. We'll walk you through it, and you know, at least get it to where you can input the coordinates, navigate to a coordinate, that sort of thing. So 
Um, with this, so as noted, uh, we're going to modify this to reduce the number of significant digits on here that are uh, a little bit beyond necessary for the great GPS we're working with. Um, but the coordinates on here are going to be in decimal degrees. Um, so in this case, it's like 65 point, I don't know, 97 other degrees versus degrees, minutes, seconds, right? Um, and so that's the coordinate format that's going to make the difference. So most consumer grade GPS is default to uh, whatever coordinate setting, whether it's uh, degrees, minutes, seconds, or degrees, decimal minutes, or you know, decimal degrees, doesn't matter. Um, but uh, most of them default to WGS84 data. Uh, everything we're giving here is in NAT83. The difference between NAT83 and WGS84 is really just like maybe a couple meters vertical in Alaska. It doesn't make that much of a difference. So we don't really care about that. However, some of those surveys that you're going to be looking at, the coordinates are going to be in NAD 27, and which is completely different data. It's the North American data of 1927. It has changed significantly. You should be off by like up to 500 meters in some of those uh, areas. So make sure you know what the coordinate system is that you're pulling from you know, when you go to input. So um, I believe, and somebody here might actually know better, Google Earth is uh, typically WGS84, right? There is a slightly different way to use it, so it's almost the same. Okay, okay. Did I know what you were saying last night? Oh, yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, okay. And for, for folks who might at home uh, didn't hear that there's a website you can go to to convert these coordinates over. So that's great. Thanks for that. Yeah, in, incidentally, uh, you know, for those who are prone to math, anyway, you can just take that decimal, multiply by 60, anyway, and that gives you the minutes, and then you take the decimal off of that, multiply by 60, and that gives you the seconds. But, um, yeah, I like the, the not math version. So. <laughs> okay, all right, so Google, Google Earth is WGC. Perfect, thank you. All right, um, all right, so we'll hop on to, to monuments a little bit later, um, and then this is the lease application. We're going to spend a lot of time on this lease, lease application a little bit later, but um, the big thing is bring copies with you into the field. I recommend bringing a couple, of, uh, a few copies. It's just a couple extra pages. When you get out in the field, it's probably going to get wet. It's going to get bug guts on it, you know, various other things. So make sure you have you know, plenty of copies to take your notes on. This is an excellent field notebook, effectively, right? So you can do all your scribbles on there, and then when you get back into the you know, back in the field, you can or back in from the field, you know, you can take this and transfer everything to a nice clean copy that you turn in. Um, so, I mean, I don't think Justin cares too much about bug building bug guts, but, you know, I mean, it's kind of nice and legible. So, yeah, really. if I can scan it and copy it, that's what I'm There we go. All right. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, but, yeah, so we're, we're going to cover this in detail, so it won't get uh, uh, into too much. But uh, there's a lot of information as to how to build this out in the general safety instructions. So. Um, so in here, we're get, there's a copy on the uh, on our website, a copy of the brochure along with the errata. So you know, any information generically about the, the offering. For those who like kind of a pictographic, uh, you know, view of the whole process, this kind of just walks you through the whole process from you know from applying for your lease application or sorry, applying for your uh, authorization, which you've already done, all the way through the process of purchase. So kind of a little bit of flow chart there. Um, all right, there's the general log uses fact sheet on here. And so this is available in multiple locations on our website. Ultimately, what this is, is this outlines kind of summarizes the, the uses that are allowed on state land with or without a permit. So a couple things that are of note is everything that you are doing out here at state and parcel is automatically within general log uses, right? So you're going to be going out, presumably going to be camping on the land by your state and parcel. It's allowed. You can camp for up to 14 days on state land without a permit. After 14 days, you have to move a minimum two miles away for a 24 hour period before you can reoccupy the same site. Um, so you can, like if you're out on state land, you can uh, you know, use dead and down firewood on site to build a fire. However, you cannot transport that firewood elsewhere to different locations. So what that means, um, so once you stake your parcel, right, uh, you can, you know, once you stake your parcel, you can, if you're going to be out camping on the other side of the lake, river, trail, whatever, uh, you can use the firewood there. But in order to harvest firewood to bring it back to your cabin, you would be required to get a firewood permit. Uh, firewood permits are typically, I mean, they're uh, it's a minimum of three quarts, maximum of 10 quarts. It's, I believe, $10 a quart, you know, for it. So, I mean, yeah, you can just get a, a firewood permit from their DNR office uh, for harvesting firewood from the general city or some state land. Uh, cutting, you can cut a trail up to five foot wide using hand tools. Um, so, pretty much the brushing you're going to be doing is within general allowed use of the same thing. With that said, we're not asking you to cut a trail. 
we're going to cover what we're expecting for you know, for that. We just need line of sight. In fact, we specifically don't want you to cut a really big wide path, right? So you don't need to go all over on that. Um, but the other thing to note is that so once your once your parcel's under lease, uh, then it's yours to to do with as you see fit. So you can you know, start using, you can start camping on, you can start building on it with some cash, uh, which we'll cover. But um, but uh, up until that point, up until you are under lease, it is still general state land. So you cannot stop somebody from camping on your parcel until it is under lease. Right. So just because you put in your corner post and flush it up and flag and everything else, so that period between. You know, here a couple weeks, and if you you know head out here early in February and take, you know, up until well, I guess September is, is when it ends. We're not going to be issuing leases until early 2023. So up until then, it is still generally state general state land. So you're not going to be able to stop somebody from camping there just because you need to stay. All right. Um, all right. And then we're gonna uh, so there's information about the uh, the program, the remote rec program, and how the lease uh, or how the appraisal system works. We're going to cover that in more detail. So we'll handle that. Um, and then the Firewise booklet. Um, I encourage folks to grab a Firewise booklet we have back here on this table. And uh, and so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, so most of the areas that we have, I mean, I believe well, actually all the areas that we have up here uh, in this offering are either a limited fire management option or a modified fire management option. And what that means is that is the state's priority. Uh, well, actually, not just the state, state and federal. So uh, the way this works, and these are the fire management options are set by the Alaska Interagency Coordination Center. So it's coordination between uh, BLM, BIA, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, uh, State of Alaska, et cetera, as to you know how lands, how we are going to fight fire jointly on lands within Alaska, right? So what that means is it sets a priority for you know, when somebody when they're going to start sending firefighters out there to put a fire out if one pops, right? In areas that are limited, generally speaking, they're going to let it burn, right? For the most part, there is a very limited priority for fire fighting fire in a limited area. For modified, you know, if a fire comes in the area, they're going to monitor it. You know, if there's other resources in the area that might need protection, and might send crews out there. But it is going to be a much lower priority than areas that are full or even critical. For critical fire area, I mean, if something starts smoking, they run out there with shovels and beat it out, right? But uh, but the reason that this is important is this: the firewise information gives you a lot of information about how you can defend your investment in this case from a wildfire if a fire comes through your area, right? So there's a lot of recommendations in there about clearing defensible space, you know, within a certain distance of your cabin, uh, impounding water, you know, limiting trees up, you know, from the ground up within a certain distance of the cabin, that sort of thing. So the point being is if I'm, we're going to use this example, and I might point to other examples, other folders that we have in this, in this workshop, but you know, if this is the situation, if you got trees right up you know, to your cabin door, and even if they put firefighters in the area, if they cannot safely get in and out of that cabin, they're not going to even attempt to protect your place, right? If you can create defensible space, if you can create adequate you know, access into and egress from your cabin, there's enough area around there. They might be able to set up a sprinkler system. They might be able to put a, uh, a crew on the ground to drop trees. They might be able to defend that structure if they're in the area. Regardless of whatever fire management option, there's no guarantee about fire protection. None of these, if you're not paying for fire service in any of these areas, you're not paying for fire service. So if they are in the area, if you've done your part, then there's a much better chance that they can at least attempt to defend your structure. Make sense? So um, I highly encourage everybody to go through there, you know, grab that book, let's take a look at it, and you know, help make that decision. Additionally, you, know, you might look at some of the recommendations in there to help you select a site. So if you have the option of selecting a site that's with a nice you know, hardwood stand, that's urge and aspen or something like that, versus a pretty dense black spruce stand, in a way where there's, I mean, really thick trees, you know, it's gonna be harder to fight a fire in a really dense spruce than it is to fight a fire in birch, right? So you know, that might help uh, make you make Help you make some decisions on that. Uh, the next one is going to be photo release form. Uh, this is so a lot of the photos that you see within this presentation are from folks just much like yourselves going out there. We get some really great photos of folks out in the woods, you know, uh, you know flipping gang signs. I don't know if you guys saw any of those <laughs> photos in there. You'll see some. Um, anyway, but uh, but yeah, so we get some you know, great photos of folks doing really good work in this field. Um, and it would be great if you are willing to do so. If we can use your photos uh, in our presentation, uh, we. Uh, love to do so. We ask you to fill out this this photo authorization uh, and turn that in with your lease application. 
Um, all right, so there, if you're going to be sending in your lease application by mail or by, uh, you know, well, by mail or fax or email, you can submit this uh, lease payment form. It's just we can we'll run the form, run the credit card, and you can shred it for me. Uh, but that's only if you're going to be sending in as opposed to putting it in person. All right, so um, we kind of covered very briefly the, uh, you know, the staking packet, some of the resources online where you can find some of this information um, up to this point. Does anybody have any questions? Have anything we covered thus far? Anything from online? Okay, hearing none. All right, so we're going to start with research in the area uh, here. And all right, so a little bit about uh, the area. There's a lot of uh, areas that you can go for research. This uh, is a screenshot from our Alaska Mapper uh, program, which we'll cover in a little bit of detail. We'll show you uh, afterwards. Again, there for folks uh, here present, there's those brochures. You can uh, find instructions on how to use that for folks online. It's on the website there. Um, but you're going to want to check out the area. Uh, you know, there's a lot of great resources for aerial imagery, for topography. On the Alaska Mapper website, we have a lot of base uh, imagery for various different uh, imagery servers and such. Uh, Google Earth is great. For, uh, Google Maps, Bing imagery, et cetera. Um, so, you know, study the area before you go out. If you have the opportunity before you go out and stake, uh, you know, before you actually stake your parcel, if you have some time in the area, spend some time walking around the area, kind of get familiar once you're in the field. Um, but anyway, but before you go out, take a look, kind of have some ideas as to where you're going. If you have some ideas as to where you want to stake the parcel, if you have, you know, an idea that you want to put a 10-acre parcel over here, do, you know, whatever, up on this river, up on this trail, whatever, you know, come in and talk to us about it, right? We cannot treat adjudicated parcels, so we will not be able to say that, yes, if you stake that right there, you will be adjudicated in the area. But we can certainly, you know, kind of give you some guidance, right? So there's some things you might want to consider about reserved areas, about setbacks. Uh, there's going to be an easement on, uh, so any any parcel that's staked across any section line, uh, that the track section, um, is going to have a 50-foot easement to either side of that section, right? So if you pick out a spot, if there's a section line right through it, you're going to have a 100 foot easement and you can't build within that easement, right? So that might affect where you choose to stay. Um, you know, likewise, if there's any trails or actively using the conversation, we are going to reserve a 60 foot easement, 30 foot side of that, uh, the center line of that trip. So just you know, bear that in mind. But if you're kind of trying to figure out how you can work around, especially if you're uh, looking at staking on a water body, on a lake, a creek, something like that, where you get a bend in the river, you know, how you can stake that parcel to where you orient it in such a way that the uh, boundaries are roughly perpendicular to the water body and those water frontage restrictions, et cetera. Have an idea what you want, bring it to us, work with us, we can try and kind of help you figure that out. Additionally, uh, whether you do it you know, here in person on the Alaska Mapper program or something else, there's a lot of great tools where you can kind of let, uh, map your parcel out in advance. You can get those coordinates before you head out in the field and you can navigate right to it, right? However, I can guarantee you the conditions that you find in the field are going to be different from the conditions that you find in your own trip, right? And so, because of that, I mean, even if you have the best laid plans of, you know, of however, of how you want to outline this parcel, whatever's going to appeal to you, right? So, you know, this happens a lot of times on water bodies where, yeah, it looks like this nice wide, you know, uh, bend in the river, but now it's kind of condensed and it's kind of a, you know, kind of a little tighter loop. That's going to affect your water body or your water front industry. So whatever's in the field actually works in that case. But uh, so, but do your do your research in advance. If you need help with any of that, come on in. You know, we're we're, we're here to help you out. Uh, so consider, you know, the, the, how you're going to get there. Uh, you know, access is going to be the biggest thing, right? Um, so with those, the, we'll cover the basic appraisal stuff a little bit later. But you know, again, access is going to be the biggest driver for profits, right? So if you're going to be right, if you want to be right up on that trail, uh, the you know, right up on the River boat accessible, river float plane accessible lake, something like that, that's going to be the higher value stuff. If that's not as important to you and you want to save the money, you can stay more to the interior of that. So typically 330 feet away from those features. Um, and you have to look at the basic appraisal to confirm that because some are going to be different. Sometimes it might be 600 feet away. Um, in which case, uh, you know, you can get the value the land a little cheaper, but then you're going to have to cut in a trail to get to it or something, right? So account for how you plan to access it um, and account how much for what you want to pay for. Um, we're going to cover reference points here in uh, a little bit later for Mount Rich Edition and uh, Alma Lakes. There's already surveyed parcels in there. There's a lot of uh, monuments in there to choose from. So plan in advance where you're going to get your reference points, right? So uh, look at those survey plats that are available on the website and kind of, and you can get the coordinates from them. Oftentimes, navigate to it. You can use that for your reference point. 
Um, if you're in an area that you don't have ready access to a reference point, we're going to talk about how you can create your own reference point. But if you're somewhere near one, we're going to ask you to actually find one. So, but this is a great way to kind of start with that. All right, so we're going to talk about some materials for staking, and I'm going to need my lovely assistant to <laughs> show me some stuff here. Thank you. So, your Vanna White. So we had we had folks in the last five workshops who didn't know who Vanna White was. The folks know who Vanna White is. Thirty of them. Must be three. I'm I'm thinking so. Yeah. Anyway. So. <laughs> all right. So uh. So first off, the staking pen. Right. We mentioned that before. You know, bring copies of that checklist. Bring copies of your lease application. Uh. You know, bring copies of the staking instructions, both in general and supplemental. If you have a question out in the field, you can kind of flip that page and figure out how you can adjust for it in the field. Uh. Bring a compass. Uh, do we grab the compass there? Perfect. All right. So I would recommend just investing in a good compass, right? So, I mean, instead of like the little Cracker Jack box, one or the one you get off the shelf of Fred Meyer, get a good Sun Tzu, Brunto, whatever. I'm not endorsing a brand. Good compass. Um, it's good if you have one you can adjust for declination, which we'll cover a little bit later, but uh, but get a good compass. You're going to get good, good reading on this, right? Because that's going to be... Right. Yeah, the, the, the mirror is nice, too. You guys know what the mirror is for? Uh, so you can see who's lost. So, anyway, yeah. Um, but so... The, uh, yeah, so the, uh, anyway, with, you know, get a, get a decent compass uh, you know, for that, that you can actually get a good azimuth off of, uh, anyway, and bring that along. Uh, you're going to need a GPS uh, and battery. My recommendation is uh, you know, bring backups for everything, right? Um, there, especially, we're, uh, we're going to cover this in a bit more detail, too, but pictures. Pictures are going to be one of the biggest things you can bring back up. We cannot accept your lease application if you don't have adequate photos to drive that. Had it happened before to where somebody goes out to the area, they did everything they were supposed to do, they took all their pictures, got their brushing and flag and everything else, they're stepping off the, the floor plane, the camera falls out of their pockets, you know, whatever, into the water, done. Anyway, they had to go back out to get the photos, right? However, if you just, I mean, if you, if, you know, you've got a digital camera, bring a digital camera. You've got a cell phone. Every time you're taking a picture with one, take a picture with the other. Better yet, go out and get one of those little cheapy 35 millimeter disposable cameras, and every time you're taking a picture with a regular camera, the cell phone, and one of those. Have redundancy, right? Um, in any of these photos, we'll cover a little bit later, but it's not just to have the photo. We have to be able to see the brushing line in the photo. We have to be able to see the flagging, uh, see the writing on their, on their name plate, right? So, you know, maybe you get snow on the lens or something like that. You don't realize it. Maybe all the, cam the photos on one camera turn out blurry when you've got a back, right? So redundancy is key. Bring extra batteries for everything, especially for staking in the wintertime. It gets cold, things die, plan ahead. Uh, you know, maybe for you know for those uh, you know who don't have like you can't it doesn't take AA batteries. You make those nice little charger kits, these little USB charges, you can you know, charge your phone, camera, whatever else uh, off of those. Um, all right, so another one that you know is is a good thing to invest in, in my opinion, is a real tape. Anyway, so that's what Justin has over here for folks online. That's going to be the little purple tape measure down at the bottom. So these you can stretch out for you know it it depends. I mean they're you know 100 yards, 200 yards, depending on how long they are. Uh, but it's a great tool for, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great tool for measuring those longer distances that you're going to be measuring for, for your parcel. Uh, they're not that expensive. Um, I believe you might be able to rent those from places such as Surveyors Exchange or something. You have to check into that. But you don't even need to go that high speed, right? Go out and get yourself a 300 foot length of rope, right? And then you knot the rope at 100 feet, you knot it at 50 feet, and then after that, you knot it at 10 foot intervals after that, right? So. You're going to be measuring, so say you're staking a five acre parcel along a water body, right? And so you're going to put 330 feet, in this case, we'll, we'll say, well, okay, you're going to stay, in this case, since nothing, nothing has a, uh, everything's 33% water body, five acre parcel is going to be rough rectangular, 330 feet by 660 feet, right? So you have 33% water body restriction, so you're going to measure out 660 feet along that water body, right? You take your, your 300 foot rope, you measure it out once. Take it again, measure out a second time. Anyways, you're at 600 feet, you pull it to the 50 foot mark, and you go 10 more feet, there you are at 330 feet. Right? So you can go pretty simple with something like this. Um, there is a, uh, there's another pretty handy tool for measuring distance it's called a hip chain. Um, I made the mistake of Googling that in one of my previous staking instructions, and it got a little scandalous there for a minute. Um, <laughs> But uh, but it is a great tool anyway. It's it's a little thing to support. And so probably Google's forestry hip chain. I think that's that was a learning moment there. Um, it's a little box anyway that you can just clip right on the you know the hip you know right on your belt. And there's it has a little spool of string in there. And as you pull it out, it clips off the distance, right? So you can you can set that you basically just tie it to the string, set the thing to zero, and just start walking down your your flag line. And it'll tow out that string all the way behind you. You get to the end, 
cut that string and it says you're at 725 feet. Something like that, right? It's a great handy little tool. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of it, and I've learned my lesson to not Google that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, we already talked about cameras a little bit. Bring plenty of uh, tools to write with, right? They, they make those right in the rain uh, pads. They're really great you know, for if it's snowy or uh, raining outside. Um, but yeah, bring markers, bring pencils, uh, bring you know, plenty of paper. If you bring a couple of your uh, of these uh, applications with you, it makes a great tool. You can write on the back of them and just fill stuff out as you go. Um, again, redundancy. Um, all right, so brushing tools. You're going to need something to brush the, uh, the your boundaries, right? So, um, and I'm still waiting for, you know, as many years as I've been doing this, I've been, I'm waiting for the kickback on sampling, right? Somebody's going to give me uh, some, because I, I love this tool. That's the one that will run, right? It's also known as a speed axe. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's basically an axe handle with this pretty narrow, thin, sharp blade on it. It is the best tool for brushing, in my opinion, right? And uh, yeah, brought to you by Carl's Jr. No, it's uh, so, <laughs> I don't want to get the reference, but yeah, I, I should be getting paid for that. Uh, but no, it is a fantastic tool. Um, but yeah, in most of the cases here, you're not going to need chicken something, right? And, and for the vast majority of stuff to do. If you're going to be staking in an area that has like really dense alders or like I mean really kind of you know, dense trees are going to be cut a lot of it, sure, right? But when you're uh, brushing your lines, any tree that is greater than four inches in diameter that's along your line, you can leave it standing, right? That sand vic is easy to take. I mean, it's plenty easy for taking out stuff two, three inches. I mean, no problem. And so you're probably not going to need a chainsaw. However, um, you are going to need a way to to make corner posts. You can either bring a corner post out there, or you can make corner posts out of native vegetation. So, like this one here, you know, cut it off about five feet, square it up to roughly four feet, something like that. Um, but uh, you may or may not. It kind of depends on where you want to stay. So, if if weight and bulk is an issue, you may not even need a chainsaw. So, just consider that when you're when you're going out there. But we'll cover brushing lines a little bit later. And if you have an idea of what the vegetation is like where you're staking, then you can make the decision on that. Um, so again, corner posts, you might want to plan for you know, bringing something to use as a corner post. Uh, so again, you can use native vegetation, uh, square off a birch tree or a spruce or something like that to four inches square, paint the heck out of it, flag it up and use that as a corner post. However, depending on where your corner is going to be, you may not have access to that, so you might need to bring your own. So you can use a four by four post. Uh, there's various different ways to put them in. For those folks who are staking in the winter, this is, it might be a little bit of a challenge to put in, to put in a corner post in the winter because the ground's going to be frozen. So what some folks have done is they take a length of rebar and they pound the rebar into the ground, and you just basically drill out the base of a 4x4 and then pound your 4x4 on top of your rebar. Uh, some folks will take something like a T-post, and they pound the T-post into the ground, and then you lash or bolt your, uh, your corner post to, uh, you know, to that T-post. Another good option not great for frozen ground, is that Carsonite post. That's the one that says survey marker uh, over here in the, uh, for those that are present in the room. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's wide, it's flat, it's very highly visible, and you can purchase these a uh, number of locations. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you can put one of those, you can drive those on the ground, they're fairly light. I mean, obviously they're a little long, a little bit bulky, uh, but uh, anyways, it's a good option. I highly recommend probably folks bring a couple of lath out. Uh, and so there's, uh, we've got some lath over here. Uh, it's not, I mean, so that is not sufficient for a corner post. However, um, if when you're flagging your lines, you're going across some kind of open areas that don't have much for vegetation, um, so you're going across the meadow or something like that, pound in a couple of those lath along the way. So, you know, the biggest thing here, so that way, you know, we can see that where that line is going in that area. But moreover, if there's other stakers out in the field, they can see where that line is, right? This is ultimately going to be, you know, for us to be able to locate your parcel, for the surveyor to be able to locate your parcel to survey it. Um, and as well as, you know, I mean, while other folks are on the field, they need to be able to, to well, while you're under lease and subsequently, I mean, if you choose to maintain it once it's actually purchased, this also marks out your property interest, right? So this is, you know, you have, this is your property, you need to do the business you fit. This lets other people know that that's a dominant interest. So uh, you're going to need some metal for nameplates. Um, there's, we're going to cover this in a little bit more detail, but uh, some folks like to prep these up in advance. It's a great idea. Um, so you can take like a little piece of, uh, of uh, sheet metal, something like that, aluminum, and you can, you know, etch it in, you can etch your information in there, you can stamp it in there. You can go really super simple and you can take a soda can and cut the ends off, cut it down the middle and roll the thing out flat. You are going to have to wash it out though, because if you just staple a Coke can to a tree out there in the woods, a bear will guarantee you eat that thing off of that thing. Anyway, so uh, same, same thing goes with, you know, your cans or whatever. Anyway, if it smells like something that they're going to eat, they're going to eat it. Um, so. 
If you prep those up in advance, I recommend bringing additional ones. So you're going to need, at bare minimum, you're going to need one for uh, each of your corner posts, so all four corners. If you come across something in the field that you might have to, for some reason, put in a fifth corner, it's good to have an extra one. Um, additionally, we're going to ask you to mark a couple of other things. So one, um, if you are not locating a monument for your reference point, you're going to need a tag for that reference point. So just bring an extra one for that. Um, and then we're also going to ask you to identify a building site, which we'll cover later. It's optional, okay, whether you choose to do so or not, but it's good to have any of those. Um, all right. Uh, so I'm uh, prepping those up in advance and we'll kind of cover some of the standards for that. Uh, flagging tape. You are going to need a lot of flagging tape. And I highly recommend getting something like this that is bright orange or pink, right? Um, yellow, green, and blue just flat out do not show up in photographs. They don't, right? So get something that is highly visible and get a lot of it. You're, I mean, I just recommend get a whole log of the flagging tape, right? You're going to need to be or, uh, flagging every 20 feet or so along that line. And especially if you're looking at a 20 acre parcel that's you know roughly what 660 feet by 1320 feet that is a lot of flagging right i mean you're looking at three quarters of a mile of flagging every 20 feet so bring lots and lots of flagging you know when you go out there um and then just a plug for you know, survival equipment give you bring anything that's going to keep you warm and safe you know make sure you have a good first aid kit uh you know when you go out there in the field you're going to be you know, swinging around around potentially chainsaws and you know, sand dicks and such um, so, yeah, bring it for a good first aid kit and also communications. I highly recommend, you know, bring in something you can, you can rent sat phones, uh, you know, from a lot of different places. Um, additionally, I mean, get a spotter in reach or something like that. If something happens, you know, you, you have a means to be safe. So, all right, um, there's, this is a woefully incomplete uh, list of places that you can get materials. Um, some of these you can actually rent things from. Um, so if you want to rent a GPS, if you need, might need to rent a, a real tape or something like that, or rent a sat phone or something. Uh, you can look into some of these places, but most of the stuff you can you can get here locally uh, for a lot of this. All right, so uh, preparing materials, GPS. So uh, as I said, I you know covered this in a little bit of detail. We're going to cover some kind of tips and tricks for uh, for how to use them um, and kind of what you need to know. So if you have a GPS, if you pick up a new GPS, read the owner's manual, familiarize yourself with it. It's a really good idea to bring that unit of the manual out in the field with you. So if something's not working the way you expect it to. Uh, a couple of things with GPS is uh, they they generally when you the first time you turn it on, it is going to take a long time for it to figure out where it is at, right? So it might have to sit there for 20 minutes, half an hour, something like that, to get a locational fix, right? To figure out exactly where it's at. From there, if you were staying within that vicinity, it generally picks it back up pretty quick. If you turn it off and then turn it back on, a quarter mile away, it's going to find itself for you. But if you turn that thing on here in Anchorage and then you fly out to all the lakes, and you go to turn it on, it's going to take some time for it to figure out that it just flew 250 miles, right? So, <clears throat> uh, so you know, warm it up. Uh, you know, when you get out there, turn on your GPS, set it on your backpack, let it warm up, let it get a good uh, position of fix, right? All right, so note the, the settings on the GPS. So, uh, you know, if you are going to be putting coordinates into your GPS in advance, so if you're going to be pulling something from Google Earth, from Alaska Mapper, from any of the materials that we uh, provided for you, if you're going to be mapping anything out in advance, Make sure you know what your GPS is setting, right? Make sure that if you are, if the coordinates that you're pulling are in NAD 27, that you set the coordinate system on your GPS to NAD 27 before you put that coordinate set, that coordinate in, and then you once it's the coordinate in, you can just turn it back to WGS 84 or whatever, and it's just going to swap back over. Most consumer grade GPSs default to WGS 84. It's the world global system, um, but. Uh, and most of the stuff that we provide is going to be in, in NAD, that, uh, the North American data of 1983. Um, and so it's going to be NAD 83. But in, for the most part, those are generally uh, you know, interchangeable. If you have any questions, bring in your GPS. You know, give us a call, whatever. Uh, but we can generally help you with that stuff. Um, so know what the data is. Uh, the coordinate format. So this could be in degrees, minutes, second, decimal degrees, or decimal seconds. Um, and when we get to the uh, when we get to the Alaska Mapper, I'll show you how in the Alaska Mapper to swap that coordinate format. Um, so uh, so yeah, you can swap back and forth on that. It's pretty easy. Um, for those of you who are going to be you know, attempting to use your uh, GPS as a compass as well, I wouldn't recommend it. I would recommend just getting an actual regular compass. Um, but note whether or not your digital compass is uh, set to true or magnetic, uh, because it can automatically calculate for for declination. Um, but yeah, you got to know which, which it is. I highly recommend that everybody take a photo of the GPS settings when you, uh, you know, when you're actively collecting uh, that, uh, you know, when you're out in the field, right? So take a uh, take a photo of it. So that way, 
you know, when you turn in your lease application to Justin, you know, if you don't know exactly how it was set up, but if you have that settings page, he knows what it is. He can make the calculations he needs to uh, when he plugs it in, right? So as long as we know what you did, we can correct for it, but, but we have to know what you did. Um, all right, so yeah, again, you can pull you know, coordinates from survey plus and other, uh, other sources as well. Um, so a couple things you're going to want to practice with and a couple short points, right? So you know, make sure that you can load coordinates in there for one. And then once you load that coordinate, you can call that coordinate back up. Again. So you know how to either uh, collect a waypoint. So if you're staying on the spot, collect a waypoint, label it, and then find that waypoint again, because we're going to need to know what that coordinate is, right? I highly recommend that anytime you're out in the field and you collect a waypoint, do two things, right? One, take your field notes and write that coordinate down, right? Just read it right off the GPS, write it down, and write down what you what you call it. Because by the time you actually plug in all the points, you might have CP123, CP706, 3 through 5, you know, something like that. Trying to figure out which one these, these, these various ones are can get confusing. Write it down what the coordinate is. Secondly, take a photo, right? Take a photo of your GPS right there, and that'll show you that this, this has the coordinate right there. If something happens, if GPS falls in the drink, you still got that coordinate information, right? All right, so uh, practice with that, inputting way, uh, waypoints, calling them back up. Uh, practice with navigating to a waypoint. Um, one kind of big shortfall with uh, with the GPS uh, for things like this, it's great for collecting that the specific location that you're at right here, or for navigating to something within a reasonable distance. However, you know, if you've noticed that, like, if I'm trying to navigate from the trash can right over there, it's going to, as I'm walking along, it's going to get to about 60 feet. And then, you know, once I get closer, I get to 20, 30 feet, it's going to be hopping back between 20, 17, 85, 31, 15, 5, 2. And that little needle is going to be start swinging around all over the place, right? If you are moving, so like my recommendation, if you're trying to find one of those monuments, as you're walking along or trying to find a specific spot, you plug it in there and you start walking. And once you get down within about 50 feet, just you know, kind of keep moving to where you're keeping that needle pointing where it's going to go. And just look, it says 50 feet and it's 50 feet that direction. And then start looking and pick out a spot 50 feet ahead and start looking there. If you try to navigate right to the spot and try to step on it, you're going to be wandering around sort of a hole. That needle is going to be hopping back and forth. Um, so, <clears throat> um, the other uh, shortfall with a lot of these GPSs, uh, they are not good for measuring distance uh, for the purpose. Right. So most uh, most consumer grade GPSs are once you get past, you know, a couple of hundred feet, they're going to give it to you in decimal miles. Right. So you are 0.1 miles from whatever your location is. Right. 0.1 miles is 528 feet. Right. Roughly. So I mean, that is not the kind of accuracy we're looking at. Right. So I mean, plus or minus 200 feet is insufficient for our purpose. So that's why we need you to measure something out. Uh, we'll cover range finders in a little bit, and you know, we'll uh, cover that. But, um, but yeah, so it's a little bit of a shortfall behind this. Um, some GPSs are able to uh, take a track log and actually measure uh, acreage. And so, you know, if your GPS is set for that, it's a great tool to where you know if you want to confirm that you're right at, you know, if you're trying to get exactly 20 acres, as much as 20 acres as you can, you know, you can walk around your parcel and map it. Otherwise, just for your acreage calculation for the lease application. Once you get your lines brush or flag, just walk around your parcel, and then Wayne will tell you how much you got. So, all right. Um, all right, so nameplates. So uh, we touched on this a little bit. Um, you know, so you can prepare them in the field. It's a good idea, but bring extras out there and you know, have a means of, of uh, uh, labeling your, your nameplates when you're out there. Um, they have to be, again, some sort of clean metal. If you're gonna be using a thicker metal, so like if you're gonna be using aluminum sheet metal, something like that, you're gonna wanna pre-drill holes. Excuse me, so you have a, a means of stapling the tree or nail into the tree, something like that. So have a prep one. Um, the other thing is that you're going to need to be taking photos of these. And so that whatever is writing is on that, we need to be able to see that it needs to be legible in the photograph. Um, so, but it also needs to be perfect. So if you're going to take that soda can, you take that soda can, lay it out there, just stick it on top of a notebook or your staking instructions and lay it down there and write on it with a ballpoint pen. And that's going to emboss it in there, right? And so that way it's going to be in there. Whatever happens to ink that's going to that fade, so you can always be able to see it. But we need to be able to see it for your photograph. So take a Sharpie or whatever generic brand of whatever, because we never endorse it. Take a, uh, a, <laughs> a, a permanent marker of choice in this case and trace over that embossing to make sure that it's visible in the uh, in the photograph, right? Um, all right. So uh, yeah, let's see here. We're going to take a break here. So let's uh, let's take about five minutes. And uh, so we'll, we'll just pick back up at uh, 11 o'clock. And I, I apologize, I should have covered this in advance for those uh, folks who are uh, here in person. Uh, so restrooms, if you actually exit these glass doors over here, you can head straight down the, uh, the hallway past the elevator. 
Uh, take the hallway to the to the right, where it kind of veers the right. The restrooms are at the end. Um, anyway, and then emergency exits, which I should have covered before, are pretty much just the same way you came. All right, thank you much. And for folks at uh, home, we're going to mute this for the time being, and we'll pick back up at right about 11 o'clock.
All right, everybody, I think we're going to get started again. All right, so uh, so kind of just to, to start with, to kind of recap everything that we've kind of come through, uh, you know, at this point, you know, so we, we covered, you know, kind of some contact information, all that is going to be in the staking instructions. We are here to help you. So if, you know, we come up with questions, if you want to talk about some ideas ahead of time, by all means, reach out to us, right? Uh, we went over the, the website, which is where you can get the staking packet, which is generically all of the general staking information, as well as the very specific uh, staking information. All of that is going to be on the website. Uh, we went through the, uh, you know, we went through the, the resources there anyway. Uh, we're going to go through the staking, or sorry, the lease application a bit later, but uh, but train path that material, bring it with you in the field, so make sure you have your staking instructions, the checklist with you, the lease application with you, supplemental staking instructions, bring that information with you in the field. Uh, when you're get, gathering information, make sure that you have all the tools in the field to get the job done when you're out there. So you're going to need to have materials to brush your lines, flag your lines, which we'll cover in more detail, um, to uh, collect coordinate information and to measure uh, and map the distances between your corner posts. And you need to have adequate information or adequate materials to either construct a corner post out there or you need to bring one with you to be able to uh, to install that out the field. Um, anyway, so. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about GPSs and kind of and making sure that you have the uh, the you know make sure you know how to use the GPS, how to use the settings. Again, if you can take a photo of that settings page of the GPS, that could be very helpful for helping uh, for us to help kind of understand how it is you collected the information so we can interpret that. Um, so at this point, does anybody have any questions about anything we've covered uh, up to this point? Okay, hearing none. So we're going to move on here. So we're going to uh, uh, talk about selecting your site, and I think we're going to talk about that. There we go. All right. So, uh, so again, if you head out in the field, um, you know, by all means, you know, you can you can go out there, walk around the area, figure out what you're going to do. You know, if you're going to be heading out there, you know, before the staking period starts. So for anybody that's heading out, you know, uh, here before the 25th, um, you know, by all means, you can head out there, you can walk around the area, you can camp out on the site. You can do all that. However, you may not brush, mark, flag in any way to mark the boundaries or any lines, corners, or anything on your parcel until 8 a.m. on the day of state, right? Um, so by all means, go out there. You can you know, walk in there. You can actually figure out the exact spots you want to put your corner post in and where you want to flag lines. Just can't mark it, right? All right. So when you're actually when you're going out there and looking at that, I mean, we've talked about some other things to consider. So you know, considering your fire wise, how you're going to defend your uh, your cabinet from a fire when it comes to the area. Considering water, considering access, things like that, uh, things that are within your budget. You're also going to want to look at other features within the area, right? So uh, one of the staking uh, rules is that you may not uh, that you can either there's with setbacks you have to stake either up to that setback or 330 feet away from that setback, right? So up to 330 feet away. With reserved areas, there is no requirement to be up to or 330 feet away from the reserved area. You just cannot be within. Um, so in the case there's a uh, there's one which is in uh, Mount Rich Edition, and then also uh, Silverbow has one at the southern end. So you can be within 50 feet of it, or you know, 200 feet doesn't matter. You just can't be within. Um, you're also going to want to consider other features within the area, right? So, um, so we've I attempted to identify any public water bodies that are within the, uh, the project area. So a public water body is any water body which is 10 feet wider or wider uh, for streams or any uh, lake, pond, or you know, standing water that is 10 acres in size or larger. So we've done our best to try and identify what these are based on area imagery, field inspections, things like that. But we might have missed a couple. Um, so if there is a public water body, uh, that public water body for any of these areas, um, if you stake up to that water body, you will be subject to a 50 foot easement along the ordinary or high water mark of that water body. Um, since it is a public water body, you may not stake across that public water body for a stream. It may not stake across a, uh, uh, a public water body stream. So if you, if you come across a creek, you can certainly stake across a creek if it's a little trickle or something like that. But if it looks like it might be on the verge of 10 feet wide or wider, I would highly recommend that you just stake you know, on one side or the other. If when the surveyor goes out there and determines that that is a public water body, so it's 10 feet wider and wider, we're going to have to truncate your parcel and you're going to get the land on one side or the other, right? So just you know, keep in mind what's out there. Likewise, 
if they find a public water body within 330 feet of your parcel, we might have to bump you out to 330 feet away from it or right up to that public water body. So kind of get a feeling for what's wrong area. Likewise, uh, for existing parcels, you either have to stake up to an existing parcel or 330 feet away from that parcel. Same kind of deal to make sure that there's you know, enough, if there's adequate room to put in another parcel in between the species, right? So uh, kind of get the lay of the land where you're at. Um, for trails, uh, so uh, you cannot stake across any of the trails that are uh, depicted on the map with the, you know, either as shown or with an ADL number or something like that. However, um, in many of these areas, there are likely to be other trails that are active in use of the state. So especially like in Edinburgh and Silverbow, um, we know that there's the main trail through there and there's a bunch of small side trails. So uh, you can stake across one of those trails, but any trail that is active in use at the time of staking will have a 60 foot easement centered on that trail. It's a 30 foot either side of that trail. Um, additionally, when your parcel is staked, your parcel boundaries are going to be subject to a 30 foot easement along all you know, along your boundaries, so 30 foot interior boundaries. So you can just stake your parcel, I mean, if you, if you want, stake your parcel right up to the edge of that trail, and the, the trail for the easement, or the easement for the trail is going to be between. Uh, it's going to be right along the uh, your parcel boundary route, right? So it's going to be a limited effect. One thing to consider when you're out there uh, in between when you stake your parcel. So when you're out in the field to you stake your parcel, it's going to be about three years between when we uh, when you stake your parcel and ultimately get surveyed, right? Somewhere there. So the surveyor is probably going to be heading out in about two years, something like that, to conduct the actual survey. Um, that being the case, if you go out there and start using your parcel, think about how you're using it. So if you want to, you know, if you want to use uh, to put in a trail. That goes, you know, uh, to your parcel, to your cabin, or whatever you, you know, however you're planning to use it, and then through your parcel and up beyond. If that is a trail that's active and in use at the time that the surveyor goes out there, they might determine that that was active and in use at the time of staking and putting these in, right? So if you're going to be building a trail through your parcel, you might want to do it on a parcel boundary. I mean, you've already got a parcel in area, but it's easier. But um, anyway, just a, a thing to consider anyway about how you build that thing. Um, likewise, during the staking period, you know, if you build it, they will come. So um, if you put in a trail during the staking period, you know, especially if you flag that trail uh, going in there, you know, there's there's a chance somebody else might find that trail and say, hey, this is a great place to put a parcel. So anyway, if, if not having neighbors is important to you, you might want to consider that. So, all right. Um, all right. So uh, we already talked about considering your budget, uh, features, all that. Um, you know, the uh, I always joke about it's a good idea to wait until you own the property before you start a feud with your neighbors. Um, and so, it, you know, generally when you're out there in the field, depending on when you're out there, you might run into other folks, right? Um, one of the greatest success stories about this program is, I mean, there have been very, very few conflicts um, anytime. We're going to talk about a little bit about how we deal with conflicts if they arise, but very, very rarely do we ever have conflicts. Most of the time, folks run into somebody in the field and, you know, they end up like working with each other to stake the parcel, right? And especially for sharing a parcel boundary, that reduces the, the amount of work you have to do by that whole parcel boundary, right? So. Or 20 acres, that's 1,320 feet of line that you don't have to brush, right? So, um, but yeah, we've had some great success stories. You know, folks meet each other on the field. They're thinking, well, hey, I'm going to stick over here. Well, yeah, I was thinking about this. And they basically work together to stake those two parcels. Um, you know, for folks that are in the room here, if you can coordinate with other folks that are within your staking area, you can coordinate travel, you can coordinate field uh, equipment, materials, things like that. It's a great opportunity to work with other folks uh, out in the area. Um, so, again, we've had very few conflicts uh, in the area, and most folks, I mean, you know, if somebody ends up staking the area that you want, you know, maybe you work with them to, to get something near them, or maybe you just decide you're going to pick up and move somewhere else. But, yeah. All right, so, um, yeah. So, uh, a, little, a couple of the requirements that are uh, about the, your, the parcel that you stake, it has to be absolutely 100% has to be used. You cannot convey you any land outside of it's, uh, it's unlawful, we cannot do so. But. Um, all the areas here, they have to be a minimum of five acres and a maximum of 20 acres. We don't have any other restrictions within that. Uh, when you're staking a your parcel, uh, you know, a lot of folks try to kind of go, put, I mean, so, you know, most par most parcels are generally, they're, uh, you know, it's somewhere within that range, but some folks really try to push the acreage and try to get right out to that 20 acres. You know, be, be careful with that. Um, if you get right out to 20 acres, great. If you end up at like 20, 20.1, I mean, sorry, 21.1, 20.2, 20 we can probably adjust that. We can do that. If you end up staking 23 acres accidentally, we're probably going to have to send you back out in the field to redo it. Anyway, before uh, you know, before we can accept your lease application. Um, so it has to be reasonably compact. I, I should also back up. If you stake 4.9, we can probably fix that. If you stake two, you're going to have to go back out to it. Um, so anyway, reasonably compact. So what that means is roughly square or rectangle, right? 
um, based on you know whatever features you're staking in the area, there's a lot of things that apply, and especially if you're along water bodies, this this start where it starts to get a little bit weird. Your bar parcel boundaries need to be roughly perpendicular to the water body, right? And that's perpendicular to kind of the average water body in the area. So if you have a really tight bend, you know, around that bend, it's going to have to get screwed up, right? Which makes it a little weird, or you might get an oddly shaped parcel, which is where you might end up with the fifth corner or something like that. But the, the parcel has to be reasonably compact, so roughly square, rectangular, maybe it's trapezoidal, rhombus, parallelogram, or, uh, you know, <laughs> pick your... Yeah, I guess, but actually the young man that was here probably has a better idea of uh, triggering the hard ge geometry than I do. <laughs> so anyway, so, um, anyway but, uh, but yeah, so it has to be roughly two to one length to width ratio uh, maximum. So what that means is that is uh, the length of it can be no more, uh, no more than twice the width of it. And that is based on the average. So if you have that kind of trapezoidal parcel to account for a bend in a water body, something like that, it goes from roughly midpoint on one boundary to midpoint on the other boundary, gives you that length, and then midpoint to midpoint on the width. Does that make sense? So uh, this information is all going to be in your staking instructions as, as well. So it can give some diagrams of some of this. Um, so if you're going to be on a water body, uh, again, as noted, your boundaries have to be roughly perpendicular to the water body. Um, you cannot have more than 33% of that water body frontage along that water body. Um, and so that is roughly, it, it's going to be maximum two to one. So what that means is long side of the water, right? So if it, assuming that the water body is not curved, um, if you have a 20 acre parcel, 660 feet by 1,320 feet, you can have 1,320 feet of water. Make sense? All right. Um, so there's a couple other things with, uh, with water bodies. You, uh, your water frontage has to be continuous. So you cannot have water body frontage in the back and also water body frontage on the front, right? So uh, you can't have frontage on two separate water bodies. Uh, likewise, if you're going to be staking around like a bend of a river or something like that, or kind of on the interior of a bend, so uh, any other so any other portion of your parcel has to be more than 330 feet away from another water body. Where this comes into play is that I mean, frankly, there are some areas that you might not be able to stake a full 20 acre parcel that meets the uh, you know, that meets the staking structures. So if you cannot stake a 20 acre parcel in there that is you know, that has a you know, maximum of 33% water frontage perpendicular to the water body and more than 330 feet away from the, the adjacent water body, but you can stake a five acre parcel in there, well, maybe five acres is what you can get in that area. That's just kind of the consideration here. So if you have questions about any of these kinds of things right, and where you are planning on staking, come in and talk to us. We are more than happy to work with you on how you might be able to design this plan. With that said, as before, we cannot pre adjudicate it. So that's not to say that whatever you come back with will be accepted, but we can certainly give you the guidance what you need to look out for and how you're going to, how you need to conform that to the conditions that are in place. All right. Um, so if um, so, there's a couple other things. Uh, so section lines, you can stake across section lines um, as long as it's not a surveyed section line. I don't believe any of the staking areas actually have surveyed section lines in here. Um, but if you do stake across the section line, there will be uh, the easement on that. So um, excuse me. All right. So. Oh yeah, uh, a lot of these things are things that are going to result in a modification of your parcel. So especially when you're talking about uh, staking across a trail, staking across a public water body, things like that. That's where we typically have to truncate or modify essentially the parcel to to meet the appropriate amount of requirements. And water bodies, especially when you get those kind of city risk water bodies, that's you know that that gets a little tricky trying to squeeze those in. All right, so finding a reference point. So um, so that staking packet includes a. Uh, it's going to include that uh, boundary coordinate diagram on there, which actually lists out the, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so that's gonna list out your, um, uh, the surveys in there. And actually, so before you sit down, uh, you wanna grab that boundary, uh, sorry, the fairy tree tag for you soon, thank you. Um, yeah, so so when you're out there, uh, mostly, or so with Mount Ridge Edition and with Alma Lakes, uh, the northern part of Alma Lakes, there's gonna be private property existing in the area. Oh, I probably didn't grab it. Sorry. So, all right. Um, so there's going to be existing private property. So there's already going to be monuments in the ground. Um, so one of those monuments is going to be like the primary monument, which uh, Justin's grabbing right there. So ultimately, this is what's going to mark your parcel once it's surveyed, is a monument such as this. So it's going to be a large aluminum cap post. And for folks online, uh, you're looking at the caps of them in this picture right here. Um, so it's going to be about a two-inch diameter post with a two-and-a-half, three-inch uh, aluminum cap on the top of that, which is going to be stamped with the information from that survey. Uh, for the ones that look like the, help me out, what was the name of that cross again? Maltese, Maltese cross. Thank you. I'm, I'm never going to, I should just, yeah. All right. 
So the ones that look like the Maltese cross, those are gonna, that's gonna be a BLM monument. That's gonna be a brass cap monument, which I didn't grab that one either. Um, it's gonna be about the same size as the one that Justin was showing you, but they're gonna be made out of brass. Um, those are gonna be on a smaller post, like a rebar post or like a one inch threaded, uh, you know, one inch threaded pipe, something like that. The, uh, most of those monuments are gonna be sitting, generally they try and put them down into where they're sitting up, like four or six inches off the ground, something like that. However, uh, depending on where it's at, through frost jacking or, you know, the actions of wildlife, or who knows what. A lot of times they basically get picked up or they might be tipped over on the ground, something like that. So they might be a little harder to locate. But those monuments come with a with accessories, right? And one of those accessories is a bearing tree tag. And the bearing tree tag is what you're seeing right over here on the right. So it's going to be uh, like what, about a four by six uh, yellow tag for the state ones, a yellow tag. And those are instrumental in helping to locate a monument. So those are... Uh, they are listed in the survey uh, on the survey plat as to where the accessories are. So it's going to list, you know, for each one of those monuments, you know, where the monument is, how many bearing trees are in the area, and then it's going to tell you that they nailed it to a six-inch spruce. Might have been six inches back in 1983, but uh, they may have nailed it to a or nailed it to a six-inch diameter spruce, um, and it is 330 or sorry, 330. It's 33 feet from there at tw uh, 27 degrees to that monument, right? So if you're walking or if you're trying to find one of these monuments for a reference point uh, when you're on the field, don't just be looking at the ground for the monument. Be looking up at the trees for those bearing tree tags. If you find those bearing tree tags, they are generally always facing the monument, right? So if you go up there, there's a couple little spots on there, little silver spots where they etched in the distance and direction from that tag to the monument. So if you see that it is 33 feet at 27 degrees, First off, you can just put your back straight to that monument and look, you know, the direction that that thing's facing 33 feet, you might be able to find that monument just like that. If not, break out your compass and look for 27 degrees to find it. Most of these are going to have three of these bearing tree tags associated with every monument, so they should be relatively easy to find in the summertime. Their time is going to be a little better. So, anyway, so we're going to ask that you, uh, that you locate your reference point. And the purpose behind a reference point is that uh, this is a known location out there in the area, right? So we know where this is. If you tell us that if you start from here and that you're going to go 720 feet at 53 degrees to my corner number one, we know exactly where that park is at, right? We can measure that out. We can map it out. This is no point. So we're going to ask you to, to locate one of these. When you locate it, take a photograph of it. But these are the silver monuments. They're kind of shiny. And it's probably not going to be very easy to see that. So one little trick is... Uh, you can take some dirt and you can rub the dirt in the top and it kind of sticks to that embossing and it makes a nice contrast with the photo. Alternatively, you can take your field notes and just lay that on there and just rub over it with a pencil and take a little etching of it that way. Um, and that works really well too. Otherwise, you know, might just you know, just take a uh, take your field notes, draw the monument and draw what it says on it, right? So if there's any question, we can see exactly what that monument was. And if we know which monument it is, we know where it's at, right? All right, so... Um, in some cases, any, any questions about monuments? I should ask that. Uh, in this very tree, mm -hmm. standard always in magnetic? magnetic oh, it's, it's true. true. It is true. Anything you're going to find on a survey plat, you're going to be in true. Yeah. 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 Right. If, if you are talking miles anyway, so I mean, in, in that case, I mean, do the best you can, you know, you can for something like that, you can mark with a GPS, but we're going to actually talk about uh, how to create a tree. So, um, so if you're, if you're that far from something, it's probably, I mean, if you're too far away from something, the information we're getting is going to be garbage. In, right. I mean, so on your GPS, it's going to you know, come out as, you know, 7.2 miles. That, that doesn't give a part of it. Right. I mean, again, you're, you're talking 500 something foot difference. Um, all right. So, any other questions about monuments before I move on to reference points, other stuff? All right. Um, so, if you are in, in, in an area that you do not have ready access to a reference point, so Silverbow is going to be one of these. Um, it's where there's um, there's some private property in the area. You might be able to find a monument off of that, um, but but generally there's very it's very limited, right? So, um, so in those cases. Uh, so you can create your own reference point, but in order to create a reference point, it needs to be a permanent prominent point, you know, within that state unit, right? And so when we say permanent, that means that it needs to be there for probably a good four years, at least, right? It's going to be two to three years, perhaps, before the surveyor gets out there and starts surveying in order to be able to locate that. So 
don't pick that spruce tree that is precipitously hanging over the bank and is going to fall in the water anyway. Right? So pick something a little bit further back. But what we mean by like prominent is if you're going to be out there and if you can pick the intersection of this trail with this creek, you know, and, and I mean, if it's named and it's known exactly where that's at, um, or, you know, in some cases it is like, I mean, the, the rock outcropping, you know, within this portion of this section and, you know, what we're going to ask for is a coordinate for that, right? So I, I just got to share this because this is hilarious. We had a, we have a staking area out of East Fork Pass, right? So this is up by Nome area, anyway, halfway between Nome and Council. And one of the gentlemen provided the reference point as the tree. And it was, I, we knew exactly what he was talking about. There was literally one tree in that entire station here. It's no, right? Anyway, but he found like an eight foot tall spruce tree growing out there and he knew exactly where to go. Anyway, so it's a thing. So anyway, all you need to find is a permanent problem point within the area. So um, once you find that point, um, so we're going to ask you to, to uh, get the very precise location on it. So whether it is a monument or whether it's something that you find, regardless of whatever coordinate we gave you for that, if you take a, uh, a coordinate at that, you take a waypoint and give us the coordinates for that, it also helps us to kind of adjust, okay, yeah, your GPS based on where we know this monument is at, it was off by 60 feet from north, something like that, right? It kind of helps us kind of ground through the accuracy of the GPS on that given day, whatever. Um, but otherwise, give us a coordinate for that, take a photo of it, and you know, take that one of those extra nameplates, nail that to the tree and put reference point, you know, John Smith, you know, such and such, put reference point on there, flag that tree up like a barber pole, you know, make it very, very obvious. Because ultimately what we're going to be doing is we're going to tell the surveyor that in order to find this parcel, you know, you need to go to this location, and from this location it's going to be, you know, 275 feet northeast of here to where this parcel starts, right? So as long as we know, as long as we can walk the surveyor to that from that reference point to your corner number one, that's ultimately what we're looking for. So permanent, prominent point, and we need the coordinate information. All right, any questions on that? Okay. Um, all right, so, uh, so then you're going to start setting your corner post. All right, so ultimately, uh, so for your corner post, these are going to need to be something that are highly visible. They're going to need to be, you know, I mean, tall enough to where you can actually see it, and they need to be... Uh, you know, permanent for the next four years or so, right? Um, so I don't think we have you know, much burned areas, but I don't, yeah, I mean, we might have small isolated burn uh, stuff within some of these areas, but you probably don't have to worry about using a dead tree out in any of the staking areas this year, but uh, use a good healthy tree if you're gonna be cutting down native vegetation, use something that's gonna be staying in there for the next few years, right? Um, if you're gonna have to uh, bring your own corner post, or if you're gonna use a four by four, you know, make sure you hammer the rebar in there, the T-post or whatever it is to where it's going to be staying out there. It needs to be staying out there for three to four years, right? In order for the, the surveyor to find it ultimately until it's all uh, served. Anyway, uh, it also helps mark your boundaries for other, other stakers in the area. So we ask that you use a four by four post and cut down native vegetation to roughly four by four or something like that. I mean, if you cut a three by three you know, post, that's fine. Um, use something like a Carsonite post. Do not use lath. Anyway, those, those laughs are just, they're not tall enough. They don't, you know, stick up enough over the snow. They're not sturdy. Um, so yeah, just, yeah, don't use that. Use, use something heavy, use something that's gonna stick out and use something that's gonna be sturdy. All right, uh, oops, there we go. All right, so brushing and flagging your lines. All right, so, um, so ultimately what we're looking for for a brush and flag line is we need line of sight, right? So we don't need you to cut a five feet wide to, uh, trail. We don't need you to mow it down. All we need is cut out that that under um, some of the underbrush to where you can actually see down the line. Limb up the trees on either side. If there, you know, if there's small saplings in the way, you know, knock those saplings down. If there is a tree that's more than four inches in diameter that's in the middle of your uh, your line, leave it there. Flag it and keep on going. Right? You don't need to, you know, you don't need to go overboard for this. Specifically, we don't want you to go too overboard because when the surveyor goes out there, especially if you're right up at 20 acres, right down at five acres, something like that. We might have to adjust for you know for some other condition. That line is going to move. We'd rather have it just be some like minor little line that's out there as opposed to like this big five foot wide trail that's now either going to be completely within your parcel or completely outside of your parcel, right? So anyway, so don't go too overboard on this. Um, so uh, so yeah, brush it, just limit up, uh, you know, to about eyeball height, you know, head height, something like that, just to make a, a clear line of sight for that. So then we're going to ask you to flag it. So for this, about every 20 feet, if you can see this, um, you know, the, the picture here is probably not too terrible, terribly visible. Um, but yeah, every, about every 20 feet flag on both sides or you know, however that works. But when you do this, we need to be able to see in your photographs there is adequate flagging that if somebody basically walks across there, they can see, yep, this is a line, right? 
So make sure that you can that it's highly visible when you're out in the field and make sure that it is also visible in your photographs. That's one of the things we oftentimes have, have to send folks back out to the field, not necessarily because there's not enough flashing, but just because their photos didn't show it, right? Now maybe they're looking in the sun or whatever. So I mean just, just you know, do your best to make sure that you can confirm that that's visible in your photographs. Um, so in some areas, you might be kind of flagging across open areas if you have a meadow or something like that. And as noted, that's where uh, that's where those that the lath comes in. Um, anyway, so uh, lath is good, T posts are good, something like that, something you can kind of flag across that open area until you get back into the vegetation. Uh, please don't use pin flags. Um, and so the uh, we brought one here with us. But we've also got well, a picture on the next page here. So like pin flags like that, don't use those. They just they don't stick up uh, above the snow enough to be able to see them. Yeah like that yeah that's that's not really good for much anyway so uh, yeah so to bring laugh you know i just have some plans for flagging across open areas if that's going to be a thing wherever your parse is at um avoid green or yellow or blue flagging it just doesn't show up in photographs very well green is hard to see even with the naked eye so i mean it's it's so it's up all right so when you're flagging it make sure it's going to be visible you know for uh, three to four years and it needs to be uh you're going to need to maintain that throughout the lease period um as well so uh, if you're going to be out in the area, double check and make sure it's still there. All right, any questions about brushing, flagging, corner posts? Anything there? Okay, um, so we're going to ask you to measure and describe your parses. So this is where, this is kind of the meat and potatoes um, of this. So the first off, uh, we want you to actually measure the boundary of your parcel, right? So there's a couple ways to do that. We talked about the, the real tape there, uh, a knotted rope, something like that. But ultimately, uh, what we're looking at is the horizontal distance of that, right? So excuse me, if your parcel is up on the hillside, if the slope, we don't want the distance along the slope for that 20 feet, we want the straight line of horizontal distance like that. So when you're measuring that out, and what this, you know, this image is attempting to describe here is if you're on a serious slope, pull out on the horizontal, measure that distance, stop, and then just add those horizontal distances together, not the length of long slope, right? Because if you're along, if you're on a pretty steep slope, that's going to add a lot to that boundary, and it might measure out a lot bigger, a lot longer than the boundary actually is, right? Make sense? All right. Um, so you can use range finders. Uh, you know, range finders help. Um, I wouldn't necessarily rely on them because something I might be, especially if you're trying to sight off of something as small as a corner post. Uh, you know, something out there, it's uh, it can be kind of hard to, to get that measurement, but it's a great way to verify the measurement. And oftentimes you can get range finders that can account for things like slope, things like that. So um, it can be a handy tool in there. So um, once you get your, um, yeah, so once you get the, uh, the corner post in, so you put in the corner post, you brush and flag your lines, now you measure between them. We're going to ask for two different measurements on there. So one is just the direction, and really simple, cardinal or no direction. It is north, northeast, west, southwest, something like that. I mean, it, it's pretty basic. You don't need to go into east, southeast, or something like that. Interordinal directions doesn't work, but just generically north, southeast, west, or northeast, southwest, etc. Then we're going to ask for the azimuth. And so with the azimuth, we are looking for basically I mean, just zero to 360 degrees from whatever it is from your corner number one to your corner number two or whichever, the direction, um, as it were, the azimuth, court compass heading, the bearing, however you want to put that in this, basically zero to 360 degrees, how to get there. So, in true. And so that is where magnetic declination comes in, right here. So, um, I, so we have a bit of information in here, so a little bit of information in safety instructions about that. Um, Magnetic declination is one of those things that people tend to struggle with. So because of that, rather than getting into how to uh, to compensate for it, to you know, add the declination to, to your heading or adjust your compass, whatever, doesn't matter. Take it however you're going to take it and then let us know what you did, right? So if you have a compass that is not adjusted for mag magnetic declination, you can take all those azimuths, write it on there, and on your lease application, there's a part where you can ask, did you adjust your that uh, compass for magnetic declination, you can say, no, I did not. So um, all the declination in here is going to be, it's going to be listed on that, on their staking map for each one of these areas. So you can, if you get a nice compass, you can adjust for declination. Uh, you can do so in advance. You can go to uh, page 29, your staking instructions as to how to do that. I think it's called page 29, but, um, but anyway, so it'll show you how to do it. If you don't know what you're doing, so, I mean, if you get some area that's, you know, uh, what, 18 degrees, you know, declination, uh, you know, you do it wrong, you subtract it rather than add it, you know, whatever, I mean, you're going to be off by at this point, what, that's going to be 36 degrees anyway, so you're going to make it worse rather than better. So, um, so just 
yeah, do whatever you're going to do and let us know what you did. Um, if, when you're coming in to turn in your, your lease application, if you are coming in in person, bring your compass with you. You know, bring your GPS with you and say, this is what I used to collect it. So, you know, we can take a look and see if it's correct or not. Make it as simple for you as possible. All right. Um, all right. So any questions on that? So just FYI, this is a uh, this is an adjustable compass. The, the photo that you see here, um, Justin's got that that compass there. You can take a look at it if you want to. There's typically a little key that comes on the lanyard anyway, and it's uh, there's a little kind of little screw that's in there. And you can just turn that to adjust the bezel for declination. But again, don't do it if you know, if you're not sure what you're doing. All right. So um, so from there, so you're going to get the you're going to get the distance and direction. Uh, so the direction and the azimuth, all of your lines, and then we're going to ask for coordinates for you. So um, with that, and we're going to go back to some of the tips and tricks with the, with the GPS, right? So let the GPS warm up. When you get out in the field, you know, throw it on your backpack when they see your snow machine, you know, whatever it is, and let it sit and let it calculate for a while. Because you're going to have a lot of stuff to do, right? So you get your corner, and once you establish this is where the corner is going to be, you're going to have to pound in the rebar, you're going to have to set up your, you know, uh, your corner post, put your name plate on there, maybe you're going to have to square it off, paint it up, flag it up, do all that kind of stuff. You've got a lot of work to do. Have that GPS just sitting there the whole time calculating. The longer it calculates in any given spot, the more accurate it's going to be within it, generically speaking. Um, if it is a, in an area that has a lot of uh, overhead cover, a lot of overhead obstruction, you know, it might be better to, if there's a, like an open area just uh, somewhere nearby. If you walk out to that open area and you get a really good GPS fix of that open area, and then you walk 20, 30 feet back into your corner post, it's generally going to be better than if you're having a hard time you know, getting the constellation within the, within the canopy, I think, right? So, uh, when you're doing that, so again, just set your GPS there. If you got your corner post in, set up on top, let it calculate. Go ahead and hit collect or mark waypoint or whatever it is. Uh, mark that waypoint and then snap a photo of that GPS right there. So that gives you, I mean, it tells you right there exactly where you're at with that GPS, right? And make sure you label it and make sure you write it down in your field notes so you know that this corner is at this coordinate, right? All right. Um, all right. So. Yeah, the, uh, so when you're out there, a couple of other GPS things. If you have a track log, uh, if you have the ability to take a track log, if you're going to be running down a trail or like you've got a setback, some of these areas have some you know, setback from a trail, setback from a river, something like that. If you have the perfect access point, you can take a track log uh, through that, and that will help us kind of identify where your access is. That's going to be one of the things we're going to be act, uh, asking you about later on. All right. So, uh, so describing your parcel. So, uh, if folks have a copy of your uh, state, your lease application with you, this is a great time to follow along on this. If you have it with you, if not, that's fine. We're gonna, we're gonna uh, show these things up on the screen as we're going here. Uh, I don't know. So, all right. Um, all right. So, again, we're gonna ask you if you if you adjusted your compass for declination, right? So uh, did you or did you not? I'm actually going to shut this. I think that other gentleman's going to have to. Check. I'm going to see if we can prop this. Okay, that should work. You should be able to come back. All right. So we're going to ask you whether or not you adjusted your compass or declination, right? So just you know, yes or no. Um, you know, yeah. Did you adjust your azimuth? You know, based on the same same question. We're going to ask you to describe the settings on your GPS. So what datum did you collect your coordinates in? Uh, what was the coordinate format that you, uh, that you collected within, right? We're going to ask for your the GPS operator information, right? So in many cases, you might be out there with somebody else who may be more of an expert at, uh, at using the GPS. If that's the case, let us know who it was, and, you know, and we can contact them if we have questions, right? So, okay, so tell you know, this coordinate's a little bit off. Can you give us more information about it? Maybe it's that's the person who owns the GPS, and we can ask them to bring the GPS in and get some information off it. So that's the whole reason we're asking for that. Um, all right, so we're going to ask you when you started staking. So um, we typically want to know when you started staking. There is a requirement in there for uh, if you stake with that you must uh, submit your lease application. You must complete your lease, uh, your staking within 14 days of the date you start. Right? Is that right? So the deal is, is we just want to know. Um, you know, so we want to know if you know when you started staking, and if you start staking and don't finish, just let us know. The reason being is that one of these uh, one of the instructions in is that you may not stake across any brushed or flagged line without prior authorization, right? So what might happen is you know one of you might be, might go out in the field and you go out and start staking, and you know partway through the process you come across a brush or flag line, right? So you follow that brush or flag line, you don't find any corner posts, there's no nameplates, you don't really know what's going on. 
but you can't stick across that line. So you call us up and you say, hey, Tim, you know, I came across this Russian flag line and, you know, I didn't see any corner posts or anything. I, I stayed across it. And my response is probably going to be something like, well, give me about 14 days, right? Because if nobody lets us know within 14 days that they've already, that they've been out there staking, then we might authorize you to stake over that Russian flag line. So because of that, if you go out there and start staking, just let us know. If you're not going to finish up, that's fine. Let us know where it's at. Give us whatever information you have. Might be able to put it on the, you know, on the, the staking map if it needs to be partial or something. Or maybe just where we'll have it in our back pocket. Somebody calls up to ask what new parcels are out in the area that are not showing up on the staking. Right? So we just want to know the date that you actually stake the parcel. Uh, we are going to ask for the uh, the MTRS or public land survey system. Hello. Uh, so the PLS information about the uh, about the parcel. I'm going to stick that there. So, hi. Right. That door is locked. So anyway, it's not, they're going to have to come through me. Whatever, that's fine. Um, anyway, so we're going to ask for the PLSS information, or the, it's actually the Meridian Township Range section information. So any of this information is going to be available um, on your staking map. And so right here you see that S22N22W. So what that stands for is the Seward Meridian. The first number is going to be the township. The second number is going to be the range. So this is going to be Seward Meridian, township 22 north, range 22 west, right? Next thing we're going to ask for is the section, and that's going to be those numbers inside those individual squares identifying which section it's at. You know, again, if you don't, you know, know exactly how to fill this out, just bring it in. And when you bring in lease application, we can pull this information out. We can tell you what, what it is. All right, so from there, um, we're going to ask you for the acreage. Uh, so roughly the amount of acreage of your parcel, uh, you know, to the best of your ability. And then we're going to ask you a little bit about the general proximity of where your parcel is, right? So did you stay within 330 feet of any improvements? One of the requirements of uh, the program is that you may not stake within 330 feet of any you know, improvements on the land you know, without prior authorization. So like if there's a cabin out there, you know, we don't know if it might be a historic cabin or something like that. It could be a trespass cabin. We don't know. So you're going to have to come and talk to us about that in advance, right? Um, if you are within 330 feet of a trail, um, we also want, uh, we're going to ask you to describe it on your, on your sketch flat. Um, and uh, yeah, and if possible, we'd like some photos. So uh, generically, anything in the vicinity of your parcel, trails, water bodies, other structures, um, other uh, private property, any existing, any staked parcels that have been staked as part of this offer, right? So just tell us what's out there in the vicinity. All right, so then we want to know about your access. Right, so how are you getting there? So are you going to be you know, just? It could be as simple as you're going to fly into the lake and go straight up to your parcel, or are you going to take ADL uh, four one nine six five seven from uh, from the Elliott Highway down through Silver Bow, approximately two miles, and then you're going to be a quarter mile west of that trail if you're a parcel. Anyway, so just generically, what it's going to be. If you have a very, if you have a defined access uh, point trail, something like that, give us a photo of it. Right. One of the reasons for that is you know, as we're going through the parcel, if we have to make adjustments, we want to make sure that you still have adequate access to the parcel, right? So we want to make sure we can protect that as, as much as we can. So take photos of it, describe it the best you can. Um, so describe your reference point. We already covered that, uh, but you're going to list what it is. So it, uh, generically, is it a, you know, is it a, did you cut down the spruce tree and square it off? Was it a uh, you know, birch tree? Did you use a four by four post, parts of that post? What did you use? What is the surveyor going to be looking for uh, for that? So describing your reference point, uh, coordinate for the reference point, and then you're going to need a photo of this. So again, if you bring this out in the field, this describes all the photos that you're going to need, or most of the photos that you're going to need. All right, so you describe your reference point, then we need that the direction, so north, south, east, that's the azimuth, so we'll say 180 degrees, so south, um, to your, uh, uh, and the distance, to from your reference point to your corner number one, right? So you're going to go straight, and you're going to start at corner number one. Then you are going to describe your corner number one. So very similar to your reference point, right? So you're going to describe it. What kind of post is it? Uh, you know, what it used, uh, nameplate, et cetera. You're going to need multiple photos. Uh, so you're going to need, in fact, uh, where's that line? Oh, there it's perfect. If I may. So, and I apologize for the folks at home. I'm going to be doing a little pantomime here. All right. So here's your monitor. I'm sorry, that's your corner post. We're going to need a, the first off is going to be uh, an area, right? So we want you to step back. A ways away, and we just want to see the general area you know, that your corner post is in, right? Preferably, if you can get your brush and flag lines from background, great. But we just want to see generically some view looking at uh, looking at your corner post. 
From there, we're going to need a close-up of your nameplate, right? So you're going to get right up on the corner post, and you're going to get down, you're going to take a photo of that nameplate. We need to make sure that we can see, you know, the name, quarter number, and, you know, your information on that. That's visible. It needs to be legible in the photograph. So then we need photos looking down your brush and flag lines uh, from, uh, yeah, basically from each corner post down towards each of the adjacent corner posts, right? Or the, the next corner post. So we're going to say that this is my, my corner number one. My corner number four is back behind me, and we're going to say corner number two is off over here to the left. I apologize for folks online. So this, in fact, this is going to put this behind me, this corner, and down the line. So this is where the game side is, right? So stand off towards somebody who's whoever is taking your photo. See if you like the card. Yes, all right. Yeah, I can tell. I can tell. Yeah. So anyway, so um, so I'm going to stand off to the side where you can see down, you can see that flag line, and so you can have your staking assistant just basically be the beginning side. So I'm standing at corner number one, corner number four is back behind me, right? So that's that, that's what this is, right? And I, you know, you can choose which finger, but there's some people put all the other extra things. <laughs> anyway, but. And then likewise, for example, going down this line, you know, so I can hold out on the corner number one and then corner number two is back here and see if we can take the line with you, right? Does that make sense? So ultimately, I mean, so you can do it however you want. Some people will, uh, you know, some people just kind of uh, tape a piece of, or, you know, staple a piece of paper that, you know, it's at corner number one, you know, corner number two with an arrow that, that way, something like that. Um, you know, or if you just take a photo of it and you keep really good documentation of which one's which, so that way we can see that this is corner number one and this is looking down the line towards corner number two, and then this one's one looking down towards number four. If you can keep that straight, that's fine. You know, just that, you know, people throwing game signs kind of thing, it's just easy to kind of tell in the photo, you know. So, anyway. All right, so, um, so then we're going to describe basically the same thing, the direction, azimuth, distance, um, you know, from your core number one to your number two, and then you're going to do the same thing from two to three to four, back to the point of the game. There's uh, additional pages in there for if you need to describe a fourth or fifth uh, corner, I'm sorry, a fifth or sixth corner. You know, most of the time, you're probably not going to need one. If you're trying to work around some odd topography or something like that, you might have to expand the park plot adjust in some way. You might need additional corners. Most of the time, it's you know, generally not going to be a thing. Um, all right, so then we're going to ask about the boundary there. So, right, anywhere uh, anywhere does that line between core number one to core number two, in this case, does that cross a uh, creek, right? Is it common to, uh, to a creek, a public water body, something like that? If so, give us a photo, please. Um, is it common to another boundary? Does it share a uh, boundary with, uh, you know, with a neighboring parcel? Uh, does it, is it common to the setback from the North Fork Custom Twin River or the setback from ADL 419? Couple other numbers. Um, is it, um, uh, yeah, does it cross any other trails or something like that? Any of those things? If it does one of those, I'm first off take a photo of it, but describe what it crosses or what it is accomplishing, right? All right, and then we're going to ask you to describe the photograph. So each of those ones of the, the corner post, the brush and flag line, all of that. For each one of these, we're going to go from one to two, three to four, or however many corners you have, back to one. All right. So this is going to be a completely optional one. So this is a building site, right? So ultimately, so again, there's no requirements to build. You don't have to build a structure. You don't have to occupy it, anything like that. Um, ultimately, uh, this is just, we want to know what the highest and best part of that parcel is, right? What part of that parcel do you really want to make sure you have in there? So if you have that perfect little knoll that is, you know, that you're not planning on building on, it's just your personal reflection spot or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, if you mark that as your building site, then if we have to adjust that parcel for acreage or some other staking restrictions, we will try to keep that in there as best we can, right? So that's just the part of the parcel that's looking for, right? So you can do that if you so choose to do so or not. You can mark it with the post, uh, give us a coordinate, however. Um, if you have that, we're going to ask you to draw it on your sketch plot. You've identified that area. It's optional, you don't have to. But, all right, so this is going to be the, uh, the sketch plot, uh, which we're going to cover in a little bit of detail. The staking map. We're just going to ask you to, to draw your parcel on the staking map and turn that in, right? Uh, turn a copy of that in with your lease application. So, with your staking map. So, this is a design, or staking, yeah, the sketch plan. This is designed to be a one by one mile uh, section of the plan, right? So, if you're trying to keep that to that scale, there's a scale bar here down at the bottom. If you're going to adjust it, uh, just let us know. Anyway, that's not within that scale, but try to keep within there if you can. But there's going to be a lot of information you're going to need to draw on here. So you're going to need to write the, the direction and, uh, or sorry, the uh, distance and azimuth from your reference point to your corner number one to uh, on the sketch plot, right? Um, and then from there, 
you're going to need to write all the if the well I'll do an order on this. Well, you're going to need to write it from the from your reference point to your core number one, and then the, the azimuth and distance between your number one, two, three, four, et cetera, all the way around. Uh, we're going to ask you to describe um, any adjacent features, right? So if there's any uh, any adjacent parcels nearby, if you have a person's name on based on their nameplate or something like that, or if it's an already surveyed parcel, if you have the lot number, you know, write that on there. Um, you know, if uh, if there's a creek nearby, a trail nearby, something like that, draw any of those features uh, on there. All right, and then draw your proposed access if you know where that's going to be. Again, you know, if we have to adjust something, we're going to try and account for that access as to how you're going to get to, the, uh, to your parcel. If you have the preferred building site, note that on there. Just draw it on there and say that this, this is your site. Um, and then if you have any questions about that, there's some really good instructions on the uh, in the staking, the general staking instructions as to how to do that. All right. All right, so any questions on describing the parcel, filling out the lease application, any of that stuff? Um, there might, it looks like we might be all out on the back table. Um, so this is all going to be the stuff that's online um, there. So yeah, I apologize. We don't have you here with us right now, but uh, yeah, they'll all be available on that staking website. If it wasn't just printed off, I could run upstairs and I'll be taking that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, actually, I'll tell you what, get with us in just a little bit. We're going to be taking a break here in just a few minutes. We can probably run that off right now. Yeah, okay. All right, so we're going to cover the photographs uh, here. So, um, the uh, yeah, so for the photographs, we are going to ask for a lot of these. And so, again, this is going to be one of those things that is a common hang up for folks, or one of the reasons that we might have to send folks back out in the field to get additional information, right? So, we need to make sure that you collect all of this the first time. So, the first one is going to be the access route, right? So, if you have, if there's a trail or a certain spot that you're going to be accessing your parcel, make sure you get a good photograph of that. Right, so the reference point. So whether if that's a monument, get a good picture of there. You can rub some dirt on the monument to make you know make sure you get good contrast. If you don't have, uh, you know, a mon if you're not using a monument, if you're creating your own reference point, get a good uh, photograph of that. Um, I realized a little bit ago I failed to note you may actually use a your reference point as your corner number one, right? Um, and that that's also described in the lease application there. Um, if you are going to be using a, a surveyed parcel, if you're going to be using sharing a corner with them, you can you can have that as a corner number one. It doesn't you don't have to have a separate reference. Um, if you are going to be in a very remote location and your corner number one meets the criteria of a permanent prominent point that we can walk right directly to, then you can actually use your corner number one as a reference point. But you need to make sure that that's the case that it is a permanent prominent point that is marked up, flagged up, and that you know it's suitable to use as a reference. I failed to add that in there. Um, so anyway, uh, so we're going to need court, uh, photographs of your reference point, however that may be, and then close-ups of your nameplate, showing all your information on there, that's adequately labeled, needs to be legible in that photograph, and then we're going to need those, the area view like you're seeing here, and then in this picture, so he is, I can't really see his fingers right there, but I think he's standing at one, and corner number two is right uh, back behind him, but need to make sure you can see that brush and flag line down behind him. So then we want pictures of the brush and flag line where we can see you know, clearly uh, you know, down that there's adequate flagging, adequate brushing, there's a clear line of sight, flagging every 20 feet or so. But as long as we can see that adequate flagging in the photos, uh, you're probably good. This is where redundancy comes in. If you take it with two cameras, there's a better chance that you know, one is not going to be messed up. All right, uh, any surrounding features? Like in this case, if there's a little creek here. That's, you know, doesn't look like a public water body. It's a pretty tiny little thing, but it's good to know that there's a creek in there. So. If something comes up, we're looking at topography imagery and it shows a creek there. There's no question that this does not appear to be a public water body. All right, um, there we go. And then a copy or sorry, a, a picture of your GPS settings anyway. So that way we know, you know what it was when you collected that information. All right, so. Um, yeah, we can we're going to wrap up with this here real quick. Um, so I'm going to cover completing your lease application and applying for your lease. And we're going to take a, a break uh, here right after that. So. Uh, so complete your lease, at least application, pretty simple. You know, you take that, your field notes, everything that went out there, all the photos, information, that lease application, that copy of the lease application you took in the field, wrote on, you got all the bug guts and everything else on there. You come back, you take a clean copy, transfer all of that in there, double check, make sure you got all the information, use that checklist that's in the, the staking packet. So you can go through that checklist, make sure you collected everything that you needed to. Uh, you're going to uh, attach your photographs. Uh, when you submit your photographs, you can either uh, print them out and label them and give them to us. Uh, you can give them to us electronically. You can give them to us on a thumb drive or something like that. We'll do our best to get that thumb drive back to you. 
but if you're giving them to us digitally, make sure that they are adequately labeled. Which I'll take one of the tests exactly what it is. Um, if you're going to be printing them out the same thing, you can you know, write it right there on regular printer paper is fine as long as you can see what it is. If you have it professionally done, like you print them out like it's glossy or whatever, flip it over right on the back. But it, we just need to know what each of those photographs is describing. Um, and then you're going to, there's a, uh, the certification page that yes, you did the, everything in, uh, in accordance with the survey, uh, or sorry, the stake instructions, et cetera. Um, you may use an agent to stake for you. Um, so if you choose not to stake yourself, you want to have somebody else do it, a friend do it, whatever. Um, and if somebody else is going to stake for you, that's fine. We're going to ask who your agent was. But ultimately, you are going to be the one who is signing off and ultimately your responsibility is off of the stake. All right, so you're going to turn in your lease application. It's going to be a $240 lease application fee. And then um, that's it's going to, you're going to have a staking map with your parcel drawn on it. Um, and then as noted, all of your photographs. So you're going to apply for your lease. So uh, the way this works, uh, staking period starts at uh, starts at 8 a.m. on February 25th. Right here. So it's beginning at 8 a.m. is the first time you can start putting in corner posts, brushing lines, flagging lines, marking your boundary in any way. So that gives you like that full weekend to go out and complete for those folks who might be heading out on open weekend. Gives you the full week uh, to, or sorry, the full weekend to to go out and complete your staking, and then we will start accepting. Uh, lease application starting at 10 a.m. of Monday morning. Um, you can submit your uh, lease application by uh, you know, by mail, by fax. Um, if you're submitting by fax or by email, we need to make sure that we uh, receive that the actual copy within 15 days to see electronic or fax, right? Um, you can submit it in person, right? If you come in in person, whatever period of time, whether it's the first day or any time, it's a great opportunity. We will sit down with, uh, with you. We will work with that. I mean, as long as we're available to do so. Work with you to make sure it's complete. You've got all that information um, in there. You know, in fact, if you're, if you're kind of trying to help, you know, or if you're looking for help filling out the lease application or something, come on in, right? Um, you know, we're we're very flexible. If you give us some advance notice, let us know. We're we're happy to meet you. I'm um, in person. I could be available after hours on the weekends, or whatever. Just let me know. Anyway, we're we're happy to to set aside the time for it. Won't we? We want you to be successful. Um, anyway, so so you've got to submit that lease application. Um, first day is February 20th. Um, again, I'm just gonna, we spoke about this a little bit earlier, but um, the, once you start staking, we ask that you, you have 14 days to turn in your lease application. So you, once you complete the staking, we want 14 days to turn in the application. But if you start staking, let us know. If you go out there, it happens all the time. You go out there, don't quite get it done, you're gonna finish up later. Let us know, give us a call, say, hey, this is where I'm at, or this is the coordinate, this is what I got in. And so that way we know what is out there in the field so we don't inadvertently authorize somebody to stake over something that you started but didn't finish, right? All right. So, uh, all right. So, parcel seniority. So, again, the within this program, there have been very, very, very few conflicts. Anyway, uh, uh, over you know, people overstaking each other, problems with you know, two people trying to get the same area and, and not being able to work it out. Very, very limited. But we do have a couple of uh, kind of protection measures in place should that happen, and it's going to be a prior to service water that we'll cover a little bit later, but uh, or just right after this. But there is, uh, so there's parcel seniority. So the way that works is if we have to adjust two parcels. So say for instance, uh, you know, we might have a, we might have two parcels that are right up, so we have a parcel that's right up against a setback reserved area, whatever, and it's right at, I don't know, we'll say right at five acres, right? Uh, you know, right at the minimum. In fact, very at, it's at 4.8 acres. And there's a parcel right immediately adjacent to that. If we have to adjust that parcel and we have to adjust, if we have to adjust one parcel, that's going to require adjustment to the uh, second parcel to uh, you know, to accommodate it. We are going to adjust. We're going to make the primary adjustment on the parcel that has the least seniority, the one that was turned in later, right? So what that means is if we have like if somebody stakes in say for instance March, or well you know, March or June, whatever, and then uh, we have somebody else that stakes you know later on in September, you know realistically the person that you know from September is the one that's going to have the you know, probably more adjustment than the one that's earlier. Grand scheme of things, this, this really ever happens. It, you know, I mean, it's it's not too much of an issue, but uh, that's how we deal with those. Should that be the issue? Um, so anyway, in the grand scheme of things, uh, a lot of this, the big point is, is if two people are kind of wanting to stake the same area, work better to work with each other than to have us figured out. If we have to figure out and do it, there's a greater likelihood that nobody's going to get what they want. Whereas if you guys can figure out in the field, you both have a mutual agreed solution. Again, this is very rarely ever issue, but. What's going to happen is on February 28th at uh, at 8 a.m. we're going to be in the office, right? So we're going to be you know here in Anchorage, we're going to be up at Fairbanks, uh, we're going to be available to uh, to start 
uh, collecting to collect those visa applications. So if somebody comes in between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m., we will work with them during that period of time to make sure that their application is complete. If that application is complete by 10 a.m., um, any of those applications received prior to 10 a.m. are going to be entered into a priority of service draw. And so here's kind of what that looks like. So, so say for instance, I've got, you know, I mean, any more, I mean, it's pretty rare that we get, you know, folks that come in right on that phone the day is taken. But in the case that I've got two folks in my office, right? I got one from Silver Bow, one from Alfred. Anyway, and I'm going to call up Justin at 10 a.m. and I'm going to say, hey, Justin, do you have anybody down there in Anchorage that's from Silver Bow, Mount Rich? He says, yeah, I got somebody from Silver Bow down here. I said, all right. So we're going to throw both those names in the hat. So we got, you know, whatever, Joe Bubba and John Smith, right? We're going to throw them both in the hat. We're going to draw out a name and Joe Bubba gets drawn. He has prior. In the grand scheme of things, we've never had to do this. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just saying it's it's not really a thing. But just so you know, um, yeah, it's just I mean, because most of the time, I mean, in the rare chance that we have people live, we've had have a couple of, have had a couple of people in there first thing in the morning, opening day of lease application. But generally, I mean, they're I mean, even if they're in the same area, they're parcel of three, four miles apart from each other, so it doesn't matter. But anyway, nonetheless, it, it, that's how it works. All right, so uh, that's how the that works. Uh, there's going to be two different um, staking periods, depending on where you're at. So for folks that are in uh, Mount Rich Edition and for folks that are in Alma Lakes, uh, both of you can stake all the way up through September 28th. There are no alternates for this. For folks who are staking in Silver Bow, we had more applications than we had authorizations. So we drew the uh, uh, so we drew the authorized stakers, and then in the authorized stakers, the winners. Um, can stake between February 28th, uh, sorry, February 25th and July 18th. After July 18th, if you have not uh, submitted a completed lease application by 5 p.m. on July 18th, you lose that authorization and that authorization will go to one of the alternates, right? So if we have, uh, you know, it's basically however many authorizations we have is minus however many we stake is however many alternates we have. I don't know if there's any alternates on the phone at all or not, but none here. Oh, you're an alternate. Okay, all right, excellent. All right, so, uh, but yeah, so every so silver bow, you get until uh, so as a and so you were a winner. You're an alternate. Okay, so you get until uh, uh, so you get until July uh, 18th. She can start staking shortly after July 18th, and she gets until September 20th. All right. Any questions on me? All right. Um, all right. So with that, um, I'm actually just gonna let's uh here. Let me see. Yeah. So I, I ran a little bit over. Um, let's take a break here and let's give it, uh, let's go to about five afternoon. And, uh, so from here, we've just got to kind of give you an idea of what we're going to uh, do after this. We're going to wrap up with, uh, the lease application. Uh, we'll do a little bit of review, wrap up with the lease application. We're going to go into the base appraisal, um, how the parcel appraised and, uh, you know, kind of how to, uh, kind of determine what the, the value of the parcel is going to be everything all the way through purchase. And then we're going to get into this, uh, the area specific. Uh, all right, so uh, 12 after five. So I think it's about seven minutes, eight minutes, something like that. All right, and for folks online, we're going to put you on hold here for now. We're on mute.
Uh, for the folks online, we're just getting ready to convene here in just a second. Bear with us. We'll be right back. Oh, man. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, you can even cut a trail there and you make that nice. All right, folks, uh, if we can reconvene here, we'll get get back to going again. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, can, can we get back together and get started again? I want to be respectful of the folks that are tuning in online that, that are here. All right, so we're going to go in uh, just a little bit of a review of what we've covered thus far, kind of going all the way back to the beginning. So, um, so yeah, we get familiar with the website, download the tiers off there, print them, uh, get familiar with the staking instructions, supplemental staking instructions, uh, the base appraisal, all that information is general to, to the offering as well as specific to your area. Uh, print out all the materials, get everything you need to, uh, to get together in the field. Use that checklist uh, on there. So use the, the staking checklist. Make sure you know what you're going to need to do when you're out there in the field. Make sure you have the materials to go out there with you. Compile all that information. Head out in the field. Get familiar with the area. Look not just at the parcel you're staking, but the surrounding vicinity. Make some good choices as to where you want to put your parcel. And then you get into flagging or uh, 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 staking your parcel. So you're going to put in your corner post, brush and flag in between all the all four of your corner posts. Find a reference point, and this is not a linear process, so however, whatever order you want to do it in is fine. Um, but uh, put in your corner post, brush and flag between them, find a reference point, get the distance and direction from your reference point to your corner number one. Then from corner number one to corner number two, three, four, back to the point of beginning, however many points you have. Describe that on your lease application and bring out there to the field with you, preferably more than one copy. Um, the photograph, get all the photographs you need. So we're going to need photographs of your corner post, photographs of your brush and flag line, photographs of your access. Uh, the building site, if you have one of those, photographs of your reference point. Collect all those, adequately describe those on the, uh, in your field notes. So when you get back from the field, you fill out your lease application, you know, put in all your vital statistics, information about how you collected the data, what the uh, information was on your GPS, and then start describing that parcel. Describe your reference point. What monument did you find? What did you use for a reference point if you made one? Describe your corners. Uh, describe uh, anything that crosses or uh, is uh, a common boundary to any of your parcel boundaries. Indicate all that information, attach your photographs, give us a $240 lease application, um, along with a uh, staking map with your uh, uh, with your parcel drawn on there and a completed sketch plat, and complete the process for that part. All right, so then, um, so once you do that, uh, to give you an idea about how the, does anybody have any questions on any of that stuff? I'll put it that way. Okay, um, so anyway, so you turn in uh, your lease application and uh, you have until, so, uh, Geez, whatever it was, July 18th or September 28th in order to, to complete your staking, depending on which area you're in. And then at the end of that, once we complete all that, then we will issue leases to everybody all at once at the after the end of the staking period, which is going to be sometime in early 2020. Okay, so we had a couple of good uh, questions come up over the break, one of which was an authorized agent, right? So um, uh, we do not actually have agents that we you know, send out or you know, provide contact information for or anything. So an agent could be anybody. It could be a friend, a family member. It could be somebody in this room, right? Um, you know, so this came up uh, in, in our other staking uh, workshop. We don't actually have, since we don't have a list of anybody, there's, you could use a wide variety of things. So we're kind of musing about some options for that. Um, you know, if you contract with a survey company, you could hire a surveyor to go out there and do that. They're not going to be surveying the parcel, but, you know, they might be willing to go out there, do the field work, locate the parcel for you. You know, it could be simpler as, you know, as simple as hiring some other, Kind of outdoor professional, maybe it's a guide, you know, whatever of some sort. 
Um, you know, or generally there's, um, you know, I have no idea how active it is and I'm not endorsing this in any way, shape or form as a site, but the, uh, there's the uh, Alaska Outdoor Forum. Um, used to be pretty active in years past. We had uh, like people start threads about uh, staking areas. And it was great. We had folks get on there, they're coordinating to get together, to meet up in the area and help each other stake parcels. You know, they're sharing, uh, you know, float plane ride charters out there to the area if they're heading to the same spot. We had some folks, we had, uh, I think at one point, four or five different stakers get in and charter a helicopter to go out there in the wintertime. Um, and it's, you definitely don't want to share the cost between the four or five people in that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great, uh, it's a great, you know, opportunity to, uh, to meet other folks. I don't know if there's still a, Red or whatever they post, there won't be anything active for that. But you know, any of those might be good places to start. Um, so you know, if you talk to other folks that are in the same you know, staking area as you, that might be a, you know, another good place. So, all right. Um, any questions about any, any other questions? Okay. Um, one other thing that came up, just for clarification, a question that came up uh, on the break here was uh, section lines. Uh, there is no setback from, from section lines. Uh, none of these areas have any surveyed section lines. Uh, so you can stake over a section line if you, uh, if you choose to do so. You're just going to be subject to an access easement 50 feet either side of that section line. So um, in order to kind of you know, mitigate that, you can use that section line as a boundary, and then that 50-foot section line is just being laid over top of your 30-foot interior lot line, you know, something like that. If it crosses through the property and it's not an area that you wanted to build something on or something, that's probably fine. Because since it's an easement, you cannot obstruct that easement, basically what it comes down to. All right. Um, and then one other thing that came up uh, in the discussion was uh, administrative parcels, right? So um, so with this, when we stake, uh, so when we offer these staking authorizations, at the end of the staking period, we might end up putting in administrative parcels. Um, and so what that is, is we might identify, so DNR might identify other parcels within the staking area. Generally speaking, what we'll try to do is we try to identify those in areas that are away from other parcels. So, you know, we might put a cluster of parcels in up off of some other trail or something like that, where it's not going to be as much of an impact as folks are standing. That's not always necessarily possible, right? Especially where we have areas that are where we have like an isolated parcel that is in a very, very remote location of the staking area. With these, I mean, I don't know, all the lakes, there might be a couple, you know, a couple spots that might apply. But if we have an, uh, if we have isolated parcels in a very remote location, that's going to cost a substantial. There's going to be a substantial, substantial additional cost to get out there to survey that one parcel. We might end up putting a couple of parcels adjacent to it just to offset that survey cost, right? So just bear that in mind. I mean, we might, you know, it, it could happen. So, anyway. All right. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So any of the so uh, well uh, through our seal bid auction. So any of the parcels that we identify for sale ourselves. Um, they subsequently we will survey them and then they come out through our annual seal at auction, you know, years later or whatever. Um, additionally, the, uh, so if anybody, if we have any parcels that are, um, you know, typically if somebody stakes a parcel and they, you know, they go all the way through the lease period to the default sometime during the lease, we're still oftentimes going to survey that and we'll offer it through sale, uh, for sale through the seal at auction. And then after seal at auction is not offered, it you know, may end up in both All right. Any questions about any of that? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if uh, for administrative parcels, we survey them along with the survey for any of the ones that are staked, and then any of the ones that default typically during the lease period or after, we still follow through with the survey and then just offer them as surveyed parcels. So if yeah, they're ready to go surveyed, you can purchase them and start using them. So, all right. So with that, let's actually get into a little bit about purchasing. Um, so, oh man, that's not working. Hey, there we go. Oops. All right, here we go. Heck of it. All right. So, one of the things, just to recap on, uh, uh, you know, on, on common errors that we have, one of the biggest ones is going to be insufficient photos. Um, and oftentimes, it's insufficient photos of, you know, we are missing a photo of a corner post or missing a photo of a nameplate. Excuse me. We, um, you know, maybe you have all of the photos of the corner posts, nameplates. Russian flag lines, all that, but the photos are insufficient to to show that there is adequate brushing, adequate flagging, whatever that may be. Um, you know, so if um, uh, a common error that doesn't necessarily uh, result in the rejection of a lease application, but if there is a parcel that's staked over a public water body uh, trail, surveyed boundary within a reserve area, something like that, um, you know, it might result in, if not a rejection of lease application, probably modification of the parcel. 
So we might have to truncate that parcel at that reserved area boundary, truncate the parcel at the public water body, something like that. Um, so in, inaccurate uh, field measurements, I mean, pretty uh, pretty much a given. Uh, for water uh, water frontage, that's going to be one of the bigger tricks, right? Especially if you have a really meandering water body, something like that. Um, you know, making sure that that water body for any of the areas here, or the water frontage, excuse me, for any of the areas here is not greater than 33% of the total perimeter of the water body. Uh, there's additional information or state instructions as to how that's calculated, but generically it is as long as the point to point distance is, you know, the straight line distance is not more than, you know, the, the difference between the straight line distance and the meander distance is not more than 20%. We just use the point to point distance, right? So if it's a pretty gentle curve, that's one thing. If you have a big peninsula going out there, that's more. You actually take the meander distance. So does that make sense to the folks? How it works? Okay. So anyway, it just, yeah, water frontage and, you know, kind of meandering or sinuous water bodies can be uh, can be challenging. Uh, the two to one restriction, that's really where water bodies come in again. So it's going to be point to point on your uh, the width and point to point on the, the, the length anyway. So on those boundaries, we're measuring two to one. And then parcels over and under acreage. Again, if we're talking about, like, I mean, just a small amount, we can oftentimes make small adjustments to time of survey uh, for that. So. Um, a little bit about leasing your uh, parcel and how that's going to work. So, uh, so at this point, you submitted your lease application. You turn in that um, that uh, uh, you're submitting your lease application. You turn in with your $240 fee and all your photos, everything else that needs to go with it. When you come into the office, we're going to uh, we're going to review it, give us the fee, give you a receipt, and you're basically just going to be sitting there waiting. So, no news is good news for the most part. During that time, uh, Justin and company are going to be reviewing the application, making sure it's complete. They're going to be mapping it out. And once we map it, we're going to stick on that staking map. So if you're not going to be staking right away, again, it's a good idea to go out and review actually building any of the materials before you go out to stake, make sure nothing's changed. But that staking map will show you if there's any new parcels out in the area. So we're going to put it on that. Um, so anyway, if we have questions, we're going to contact you. We're going to work with you. You know, if your parcel, and, you know, if it looks like it's 20.1 acres or something like that, we're going to say, hey, you know, what are we, we you know, looked up, you know, so Don, we, your parcel looks like it's 20.1 acres. You know, do you have, would you rather move core number one, core number two, where do you want us to move? How do you want us to bring that back in? Same thing if you're over a water frontage uh, requirement or something like that. We might be able to make small adjustments, something like that. So at the end of the staking period, um, so everybody is going to go into a single date of entry early in 2023. So uh, the date of entry, that, sorry, everybody's going to go into a lease at the same time, which fixes the date of entry. Um, that's going to be important because we're going to use that for our the appraisal of the parcel. So the way that works, the base appraisal is already completed, but we make adjustments to the base appraisal based on changes between the date of the base appraisal and the date of entry in the parcel, which is going to be early 2023. So uh, we'll, we'll cover how that, how that affects your appraisal. But uh, so during that, that lease period, so you're going to lease it for three years, possibly up to four, if we have to extend it to account for time for the survey or something like that. Um, so during that time, you need to maintain your brush and flag line. So that is, you know, that's your boundary. The surveyor needs to find it. That's also your lease interest in that case. Um, so while, you're, while it's under lease, you can't use that. If you are leasing that property, you have the sole and exclusive right to use that property. You can start occupying, you can camp on, you can even start building on it if you want to. But I'm going to strongly encourage you to follow a couple of suggestions. Um, if you're going to build on it, first off, try to make whatever you're building in a temporary structure, right? So like a, uh, like whether it's a wall tent platform or a cabin on a, a non-permanent foundation. If we have to move your parcel uh, or your parcel in some way or adjust it for something that we didn't know based on review of the lease application, we cannot approve that parcel until after that uh, encumbrance or whatever is moved. So if you build like right up next to the boundary and we have to move your boundary, now you're half of your cabin is outside your parcel or all of it. Yeah, we, we couldn't authorize that. Uh, or if you, you know, build a little too close to the river or something like that, where there's a hundred foot building setback for the river and you build right within that hundred foot, you have to move that cabin out of that before we can authorize that parcel. Um, so because of that, you try to build towards the interior, try and make it, you know, uh, you know, on a, non-permanent foundation, you know, you're looking at probably three years anyway before, uh, uh, you know, somewhere in three years between the lease and when it ultimately gets purchased anyway. Um, so you're going to be making quarterly payments. We're going to cover the cost of that here uh, momentarily, but uh, but yeah, you get to use it during uh, during that time. Um, so at the end or during that three-year period, we are going to, the Department of Natural Resources is going to contract for the survey of all those parcels all at once. And although the appraisal has already been done, we're going to appraise them once the parcel survey, which we're going to cover. So a little bit about how that, that lease works. So you're going to be paying for three things during that lease. There's going to be a uh, there's going to be a $240 annual lease fee, and that's going to you're going to be making quarterly payments. So that's going to be $60 uh, per quarter. 
you're also going to be paying a survey deposit. So the survey deposit, depending on which area you're in, is going to be you know upwards of five to seven thousand dollars per parcel. Um, we don't know it, until we figure out how many parcels are in each area and where those parcels are. We don't know exactly how much the survey is going to cost. So we're going to uh, start charging you uh, prorated and. Uh, or we're going to start charging you based on the a quarterly amount and prorated by acreage, some portion of that survey fee for how much we think it's going to cost. Um, so anyway, it could be up to seven thousand dollars, or it could be forty-two dollars per four. Um, anyway, and then we're going to do a uh, uh, a five hundred dollar. I'm sorry, uh, five hundred eighty-four dollars per quarter. Then we're going to do an appraisal deposit. That's forty-two dollars per quarter. Um, and the appraisal deposit is just I mean for basically your, by statute you are required to pay for the survey and appraisal. Of this property before you can purchase it. It's the way the statute set up. So you have to pay for the appraisal on this. Um, none of, it doesn't apply to any of the areas here, but if you are in an area that, you know, some of the areas have been in areas that exercise uh, some of the staking areas have been in boroughs that exercise planning or taxation authority, none, that doesn't apply here. All the lakes is within the Denali borough. They don't currently exercise uh, zoning or taxing, but it's a thing. So anyway, uh, the takeaway for this is you might be paying up to you know six hundred eighty some dollars for you know, during that you know uh, per quarter uh, during that lease period. But the way this uh, so at the end of the uh, yeah we're uh, probably there anyway uh, well okay maybe not so um, at the end of the um, the lease period and so obviously once the parcel is actually surveyed. Um, then you are going to be uh, the you're going to be paying for the fair market value of. Uh, the parcel minus whatever you already paid towards the survey cost. The lease fee and the appraisal fee do not come off the final purchase price of, of your parcel. And we're going to we'll cover that. So during that, uh, during the lease, of course, we're going to have a contractor survey it. Um, and the survey, we're going to come out with a uh, plat looks very similar to this, right? So uh, this is going to include, this is going to uh, depict where all those monuments are, all of your quarters are. It's going to list any of the Building setbacks, easements, anything like that that apply to your parcel, it's all going to be indicated on here. We might have to adjust your parcel for some program programmatic requirements or conditions in the field. We might have to make some of those adjustments uh, during this uh, during the survey process. If so, we're going to reach out to you if it is if any of those modifications result in a change of more than 10% of the size of your parcel. In the grand scheme of things, you know we're going to we're going to come talk to you. We have to adjust anything anyway. Make sure you know what we're what we're doing. Um, so anyway, they're going to come out with a survey plat. It's going to depict all the information on there, and then we're going to ask you to come in and uh, and sign that plat. Um, so one of the big things with this, uh, when we contact you to sign this plat, which is also going to be three to four years from now, um, please, please, please come do so in a timely manner. Please come in and you know, come in, sign the plat pretty shortly after. We've got you know in some of these areas 20, 30 people maybe. No, it's not. Anyway, 10, 15 people. That we have to get uh, you know, through this lease period, we got to have to get the survey completed. So the longer it takes you to come in, the more it holds up that process. So please be timely about coming in and signing the plat, reviewing and signing the plat, I should say. When you're reviewing the plat, this is ultimately what you're looking at. So, uh, so any of those restrictions that are to your parcel, these are some of the common ones. Any parcel, regardless of where it's at, is going to have a 30 foot uh, easement along the all the boundary, so on the inside, the interior parcel boundary. Uh, any parcel that's taken across a section line is going to have a 50 foot. Uh, uh, easement either side of that section line. Um, the uh, any parcel that's going to be on a water body is going to have a 50 foot easement upland of the ordinary high water mark of that public and applicable water body. Um, if there's any active any trails that are crossing through or along the boundary of a parcel, that I um, mean, if that trail is active and used at the time of staking, there will be a 60 foot easement on that on that trail. Um, some of the things that vary depending on which area you are at. Some water bodies might have a 100 foot building setback. From ordinary high water, um, up from the yeah, or our ordinary high water mark of that public water body. Some might be 100 foot. Depends on which area. Um, I believe that uh, Mount Rich Edition is 100 feet, and I believe that Silver Bow and Alma Lakes both have a varying 100 feet to 50 feet. I believe for Alma Lakes, it is 100 feet for anadromous water bodies, 50 feet for all other public water bodies. And well, in the case of Silver Bow, there's no anadromous water bodies so at I think it's just 50 feet, but don't hold me to that. Give you your state instructions. Um, so any of these easement setbacks, they apply uh, during the entire lease period, as well as uh, once you're going to pay it off during the contract and it and for the past. So um, generally, so building setback is pretty much your stand. You can't build within that setback. Uh, for easements, you cannot start. Anyway, it is a public access easement system. You can jump along to the zone at some point. 
All right. Um, all right, so you're going to get a copy of this. I already uh, covered that. Uh, so please be timely about coming in sign down. So basic phrases. So uh, everybody should have already seen this part of the. Uh, so this part of your. This was part of the brochure, and it's also included in your supplemental statement instructions. And this, uh, the basic appraisal is ultimately it is a way of determining the hypothetical value for any parcel that you might stake in the area. So most of these areas are going to be broken up into a key parcel A or a key parcel B. If it gets in the case of all the lakes, you've got a key parcel C as well. So uh, generally speaking, the key parcel A or key parcel B are going to be those ones that are up on, well, for all the lakes, A and B. Um, a is going to be a lakefront park. So that is going to be up on one of those lake, uh, those boat lane accessible lakes within the area. Key parcel B is going to be a, oh, in this case, key parcel B is going to be an interior, and a key parcel C is going to be riverfront. So anyway, there's three different flavors in there. Uh, for the other ones, it's typically going to be a, a one that's up uh, uh, here. Let's just actually take a look at that here real quick. So Mount Ridge Edition. Um, oh, there's apparently only one key parcel. <laughs> yeah. Is it one of I thought there was different. Really. Ah, what do you know? All right. So anyway. Yeah. So at any rate, so um, so with that, so with Silverbow and Mount Rich, it's probably a lot easier because you only have one key bar. So, so you can assume that's going to cost within that size, you know, for a average an acre parcel um, that meets those criteria, it's going to cost about X amount. In the case of all the lakes, for your average, you know, 10 acre parcel on a uh, on a lake, it's going to cost X amount. The same uh, average, you know, 10 acre parcel on a river is going to cost something different. So that's what that key parcel A and key parcel B are about. If you want to see uh, more information about kind of uh, you know how the pie was baked, so to speak, in the base appraisal, the base appraisal information is available on on our website uh, in the area specific information in there. Um, but the takeaway behind this is that ultimately this will allow you to kind of figure out um, you know what kind of parcel is going to fit your needs and be within your budget uh, for what you want to stake. So when you stake something, you're going to get uh, so what was the parcel staked? Uh, and subsequently surveyed, uh, we're going to go out, we're going to reappraise the parcel based on that, that base appraisal. And the appraiser is going to be looking at the parcel. Oh, I should have brought this far away from the mic. The uh, appraiser is going to be looking at your parcel relative to the base appraisal, which is the average thing, right? So if you're looking at base appraisal, uh, your hypothetical parcel is going to have, uh, it's going to you know, have a certain characteristic. So, uh, in the case of silver bow, it's going to have an adequate building site, wooded, and adequately drained soil. Uh, the amenity is going to be a typical view of the surrounding area, right? So, if you're a silver bow staker, you know, and it is, uh, and your parcel is, I mean, has the absolute most stellar view. You can see a 360 degree view of all the mountains, and I mean, there's 80 inch moose wandering around at any given time. Uh, you can pick out what it is. So if you have the most stellar like Valhalla of a parcel, that might drive it up like maybe 10%, right? So on this, uh, if you can see over here on the far side, on the far right in that little column where it says adjustment, you'll see that most everything in there is, you know, 1.0. So that means it wasn't adjusted. The biggest one on this one is, I believe it says 8.3, uh, because since that parcel is larger, uh, the, the value per acre decreases as the size increases. So you're paying less per acre for a 20 parcel than a 20 acre parcel than you are for a five acre parcel. You're still paying more money overall, but just less per acre. So in this case, uh, I think it's an eight something acre parcel. Um, so it's gonna be about 83% per acre of the cost of what a five acre parcel. But the big takeaway with this, we've had some people in the past try, I mean, they really want to, they want the biggest parcel they possibly get, right? So they go out and they take, they stake 20 acres of just the nastiest lowland swampy crap that you can get. Anyway, and thinking that they're going to save money, they might have saved themselves 10%. Probably not really worth it, right? So pick the parcel that you're going to want and they're going to use. Anyway, something that makes, you know, that, that's good for you and just, you know, that's within the budget, right? So maybe, you know, maybe you only need seven acres, eight acres, or something like that. But as long as it's going to be something that you can use, something you want, that's going to be the big difference. In the grand scheme of things, most of the time, you know, I mean, for if you have the best view, the best access, you know, whatever. I mean, if everything is the most perfect thing, you know, you might be up or down, or well, in that case, up anywhere on this by maybe 20%. I mean, 25 is pretty high, you know, a pretty high difference based on that base appraisal, right? Within that key part. Right? Does that make sense? All right. 
All right, so um, so then you basically have the option to purchase the parcel. So uh, uh, so after the so the lease comes, uh, so yeah, we we surveyed the parcel, we appraised the parcel, and then you're going to uh, once everything's surveyed and appraised, you're going to get a purchase packet mailed. Um, so at this point, uh, you can't. You have a couple of options, right? So you can you have the option to purchase the parcel, um, and you can purchase it outright, or you can enter into a contract with the state. Um, so you can also, if you choose to, you can continue leasing the parcel um, on here on there uh, for up to five years. If you continue leasing the parcel, it's uh, twelve hundred dollars per year, none of which goes comes off the purchase price. So that's twelve hundred dollars a year just to be with your down, right? However, during the lease time, you can purchase it, you know, at any time during the lease if you choose to do so. Um, but uh, so yeah, you can enter in a contract. Uh, when you purchase it, it is sold fee simple for the for the surface state only. State of Alaska uh, steps or actually constitution prohibits from disclosing the mineral rights, so you don't put the mineral rights with it. Um, but uh, but yeah, anyway, so fee simple for that. We don't hold any post patent restrictions, um, and there's no prove up requirements or anything they have to do for that. So uh, when you purchase it, it is oh come on, there we go. Um, so. If it is less than $2,000, uh, then you have to pay it off in full. You don't get to finance with the state. If it's more than $2,000, you can finance with the state. Um, and it, the, the term, the length of the financing, depends on the principal amount. So if it is, uh, so as noted, the survey cost comes off the final purchase price. So if you have a, we're going to say a $15,000 parcel. If you paid $5,000 during the lease period toward the survey deposit, so just the survey deposit, then you now owe us $10,000, right? I said this. Okay, I can imagine. Um, so if you if, if it's fifteen thousand dollars parcel, you paid five thousand for the survey deposit, you now owe us ten thousand dollars. In which case, you could finance that uh, for up to ten years. Well, as long as it's ten thousand dollars, uh, you can finance it for ten years. The, the uh, terms of the financing is three percent above the prime interest rate uh, listed in the Wall Street Journal on the first month, the first day of the month in which the contract is written. So what that means is that if you enter into a lease. Say we're going to say, uh, sorry, you enter the contract for this sometime in, I don't know, we're just going to say it's September 2026, right? Then you're going to pay whatever the Wall Street Journal prime interest rate is on September 1, uh, 2026, plus 3%. Right now, it's been about 3.25%, has been hovering around that area for a while, but I think it's still 3.25. Uh, but anyway, so it's 3% above prime. Um, so with that, in order to do that, you're going to have to pay 5% of, you know, the 5% uh, of the principal amount uh, up front, and then you can enter into the contract based on the remaining. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. All right, so that pretty much covers um, everything for uh, the general how to stake a parcel, uh, tips and tricks, all that kind of stuff. Um, oh, there was one other thing that came up over the break. Um, so as far as transferring your parcel. Right, so um, the staking authorization is non-transferable, so you cannot transfer the staking authorization uh, to somebody else. You can have somebody else stake for you, and then you can purchase that parcel, and you, uh, so the lease is also non-transferable, so you are the only one who can lease that. Once you convert from lease to sale, so once we give, uh, come out and say, this is what it's going to cost to purchase this parcel, you can enter a contract to pay it off. At that time, you can transfer that interest to somebody else at that time, but not before. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> you have to give that to me because I will properly dispose of that for you because I am a good public servant. Um, so, uh, no, no. So, so here's here's the deal. So, um, it, it's it's interesting. Um, there's a little bit of a loophole in. Uh, I say loophole. I probably can't. Uh, there's a little. There's a little bit of a loophole in in, uh, in the state system, right? So the only way to legally transfer the ownership of gold from one person to another is, or from the state of Alaska to an individual, is through a mining claim, right? If somebody owns, if somebody has a mining claim, they have the legal right to extract that gold, and they now own said gold. They don't have to extract it; they might have to pay production royalties, etc. But generally speaking, that's it. However, it is also generally allowed used to be to. Um, if you look at that generally allowed use fact sheet, you can you can recreational mine on state land. Without a permit, you don't need a permit. You don't need a uh, you know you don't need a structural lease any of that kind of stuff. You can just go out recreational mine as long as it's uh, as long as it's not claimed up by somebody else. That includes areas that are closed to the country. The irony though is if you whatever you're paying out of there, there's never been any legal transfer of that gold from the state of Alaska to you. We say you can do it and we say you can keep it, 
um, but it's just it's never been legally transferred. So I mean, you can say you can do with that information what you will. So no, technically, yeah, if you find gold, I mean, technically it probably still you know, belongs to the state of Alaska. I mean, I'm just I should be that because we're recording this. But <laughs> if I found the state of if I found a, a, a five pound gold nugget on my uh, chunk of land, I probably actually found it on that mining claim that I just did over here to all the way. So anyway. <laughs> No, it is. So the, the areas that we have, actually, in all seriousness, uh, the areas, uh, all the areas here are closed to mill entry. Um, and so what that means is that that prohibits uh, anybody from staking a mining claim within the area. So, um, so yeah, somebody could not stake a mining claim and then mine underneath the recreational path. Or something. Um, right. But because of that, it is so it is uh, it's closed to mineral entry. Somebody cannot stake a mining claim, but likewise, nobody can claim. So anyway, it's. So, all right, uh, does anybody have any questions on anything we've covered up to this point? Okay, so, um, all right, so we're going to cover the, uh, we're going to cover the staking areas here, and so if, uh, we're going to start with, if uh, nobody minds, I think we'll start with uh, Silver Bow, and then I think we get into, here, I'll check here, uh, Alma Lakes, and then Mount Rich. Is that a good order for folks? Does anybody care? Okay. All right, so we'll, we're going to start here. We're going to go through some general information. I don't necessarily know all the details about these areas, but I will do my best to kind of guide you through some of this. Um, and, uh, and if you have questions, we can certainly try and get that information to get back to you later afterwards. Uh, so Silver Bowl Creek, uh, so this is up in Interior, Alaska. If you have an authorization, you probably already know where it's at. Uh, it's up on the, uh, the Elliott Highway, kind of between Minto and Manly. Um, up there, it is accessible by, I mean, principally by ATV and snowboard. Um, it's you know, generally accessible year-round. Um, sounds like the trails up there are a little bit snowed in at the moment, perhaps, but, you know, we've had a lot of snow up there this year. Um, so, uh, so there are a couple of uh, specific um, uh, conditions with this you need to be aware of. There is a, there's a setback from the Elliott Highway, a 300 foot setback, staking setback from the Elliott Highway, and that's from the edge of the Elliott Highway right of way. Um, so with that, we authorize a we authorize the issuance of easements with for any parcels that are staked between the setback from the Elliott Highway and the Elliott Highway right of way. Right. So what that means is if you stake within 1,320 feet of the Elliott Highway, we can grant you an easement. All you have to do is you have to submit a, uh, a, an easement application development plan, say this is where I want to put it, and we will grant you access for that easement, uh, basically across the state lane to get to the highway. Important. Right. We cannot speak for DOT. We can issue that easement, um, but in order to uh, to connect to the DOT right, uh, the, the DOT maintained right of way, you're going to need a driveway permit from DOT to do that. And we can't speak for them; we cannot guarantee that they're going uh, to they issue that. Additionally, they might uh, just in order to minimize the number of approaches on the highway, uh, they might require con uh, the, uh, consolidation of access. So you might have to basically you might have to have a shared trail with one or two or three other parcels. To get through that, you know, that uh, basically through the corridor to connect to the highway, something like that. And they might have some special stipulations about an apron or something like that. But again, I mean, so we can issue the easement, but you have to get a permit. All right. Um, all right. So uh, Silver Bow has two different staking periods. Anyway, so the uh, uh, so the first one starts February uh, 25th, anyway, and then uh, and you have until July 18th in order to stake. Um, and then for the alternates, so you get to start staking July 22nd if you would like to, and then uh, it ends on September 20th on that one. Um, this is a modified fire management option. So in review, that means that it's going to have you know, generally a low-ish, uh, you know, pretty low uh, priority for um, uh, for firefighting in the area. So if a fire comes out in the area, if there's if it's a big fire here, they're probably not going to be able to. Your responsibility to to create your defensible space and protect your investment the best you can. Um, it's within game management unit 20 F and there's no borough or anything out there. So no, uh, we're going to be approving the plat, uh, no taxes, no zoning, zoning presently in there. Um, there is an, uh, there are a number of private properties, not within the staking area, but to the outside of the staking area. So off to the, uh, to the east and to the south, uh, there's private property. So please be respectful of private property. Uh, when you're out there, make sure that you're not, I mean, if, as long as you're staking within the area, you're not going to be on somebody else's private property, but uh, bear in mind that there's some. That could be useful for finding a reference point if you're going to be staking somewhere in that area, but um, you know it's up to you. Um, so uh, there are a couple of very specific setbacks that apply only to this area. There's a 150 foot setback from the from the trail in attachment A. Uh, there are two trails, and ADL uh, 421306 and 421307. 
Um, so there, there's one trail that roughly bisects down to the center of the staking area, and then there's uh, another one off the east side. Um, so you cannot stake, stake within 150 feet of either one of those trails. So it's a setback, which means that you have to be 150 feet away from the trail or 330 feet away from that setback. So 480 feet by math. So anyway, 300 up, up to or 330 feet away from the edge of that setback. Uh, there's also a 300 foot setback from the material site and also the Elliott Highway. So um, again, right up to that 300, uh, right up to that 300 foot setback or 630 feet away from that. All right. So any questions on that? Yes. So on the trail, uh, don't consider if we were to stake off of the trail or responsible for that 480 feet to our parcel to get it in yep. whatever. Is that considered legal action? Right. So the right to use it. Yeah. So actually, um, so good question. Um, so the easements have, so the easements are a legal access, right? I mean, that's protected. It is, you know, a special right reserved to, you know, well, in this case, it is reserved, you know, for the public by the state of Alaska and the easement is actually held uh, by DNR in this case, but it is a professional right. Yeah, as well. Um, the rest of the parcels can just apply to anybody. Um, so as a, as a general use on state land, you can cut a trail up to five foot wide using hand tools. It does not give you any preferential right um, or any exclusive use of that trail if you do that, right? Uh, so you can cut a trail up to five foot wide. You can also use an off-road vehicle up to 1,500 pounds um, across state land on or off of an easement. So that would be an ATV or like a small side-by-side -side and something like that. And you can use that for legal access to parcels um, without, you don't need to get an easement to do that. You know, we oftentimes encourage folks to get an easement you know, to their parcel um, just for protection, right? You know, and you, know, you look at things like historically over the years, um, you look uh, right down here on Amy, right? I mean, a lot of land was granted to Cedar. Um, and so the state of Alaska had sold land through like an old open tenantry program or something since the 50s, 60s, pretty much early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, and beyond. And, you know, in some cases, Siri uh, applied for it and subsequently was granted. Um, these lands surrounding like other private property, and if those people didn't have an easement, they might have lost legal access to the property, right? So I'm not saying something like that could happen. There's been a lot of various different land grants over the years, but that would regardless, if you have it, I mean, yeah. it's, always, it's a good idea to get an easement. You don't have to. You can still legally access your parcel by generally allowed to use it because you can uh, offer a vehicle up to 1,500 pounds across state land on or off from the south. You can cut your own trail up to five feet wide. And the that is correct. So, yep. Yeah, so, they on on one of those easements. So, <laughs> yeah. ADL three hundred seven is currently gated, blocked off for no trespassing signs. There's a big metal gate across it. A bunch of no trespassing signs hanging on it. That's the current status of. Uh... Huh. <laughs> Are you guys going to deal with that, or do we need to call the troopers? Or... Well, now I do. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, well, actually, it's not me. It's not going to. I'm going to talk yeah. to Northern Region folks. But yeah, um, right. Yeah, that is that is really interesting. I I had not heard of that. So, okay. Well, thank you for bringing that to my attention because yeah, that that is. I mean, it is a legal access to basically should get. Uh, yeah. And they saw the same thing I saw. We yeah, we both talked about it. Today. It's on the map of the ADL, but it's blocked off. It's metal gate, trespass designs all over. Right. Uh, yep. So, yeah, we, we can, yeah. <laughs> all right, so, thank you. Uh, would you. Would you make note of that and make sure I don't forget? Because, yeah, we'll have to, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry, how did you what? How did you get that easement? Oh. Uh, Oh, yeah, it depends on where it's at within the area. So if you're if you're within that area that was authorized, like the LA Highway and such, um, so in that case, all you have to do is so, um, so and we I don't know here I'm gonna um, there there's quotation marks on here for a reason. Um, so we authorize it. Uh, said easement. Um, so what you authorize will get land to be sold. We authorize the issuance of easement, which basically just means that we went out to the public and we said, hey, if this situation comes up, if somebody stays between the highway and 1,300 feet from the highway. We're just going to automatically assume that DNR can give the easement. We're authorizing ourselves to give the easement without having to go out through the separate adjudication process and public notice and everything. Right? So, if you were within one of those areas, all you have to do to get that easement is to uh, submit an easement application, which includes a development plan and say, This is where I'm going to build this easement, and this is how I'm going to build it. So, basically, I'm going to, you know, 
cut the trees down to 10 feet wide, you know, instead of the five foot wide by going about music or whatever, put some gravel down. Whatever you're gonna do, however you're gonna do. Um, or even if you just want to do it on a five foot trail. So you just give us a development plan, location, and then uh, you know, with that uh, easement application, and then we can grant you the easement. However, uh, and so if, let me back up. In this case, um, if so, we can survey that easement as part of the survey of the uh, remote rec staking area if that easement goes in within that time period. But um, outside of that, we can't necessarily. But ultimately, that was a kind of an adjudication time period study with the department. We don't have to adjudicate 15 different easements across the other time. If you're outside of that, um, it's basically the same process, but the difference is that we haven't already authorized it. So you tell us, you know, use an application. Uh, submit the fee, give us a development plan, all that. Say this is where I want the easement to go from this trail to my parcel, and then we just have to go out to public notice, and you know, we have to write a decision that we're going to authorize the state of last location of easement, location, etc. And then we're going to need a survey for that, or uh, a survey and location diagram uh, for it, and then we can extend it. Through. So, so when you guys the plan, you can just drop that application along with your state application. Save everybody probably time. Okay. Probably. I mean, you know, it, it probably would in the grand scheme of things, it probably doesn't matter as much. Anyway, so so realistically the big thing is, is I mean it's, it's you know, if you locate it as part of the plat or you can locate it afterwards, it probably doesn't matter much. You know, I mean it's just it's might save us a little bit of time, but you know, to be honest with you, I mean I it might be better instead of trying to like rush it in and get it done early, just you know, make sure you know exactly how you're gonna do it, where you're gonna do it. But don't, you know. Try and rush into access that might may or not be the spot. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. So, any other questions? All right. Um, so, yeah, that I mean, that pretty much wraps up uh, Silverbow. Um, any other questions about the area or anything? Or anybody, anything from anybody sticking in Silverbow online? Have any questions? Okay. So we're going to move on to Alma Lakes. Uh, same, same general thing. Uh, you know, a lot of general information about it. Um, it's accessible primarily by the float plane and ski plane. Um, you know, portions of the area may be accessible by the Cantation River, the Verapa River. Um, it's a long run, as I think some folks might know. I know if you're particularly. Uh, it's a long trip up there. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, but yeah, it, it is. Uh, so just that that one portion on the Verapa is accessible directly by a river. Um, so the Rex Roosevelt Trail, the Kobe Cantishna Trail, uh, you know, uh, both well, they fork off just outside of the area and both cross through the area. You know, depending from year to year, I mean, sometimes they're in, sometimes they're not. Uh, anyway, I, I don't know what the status of it is this year. You might have a better idea. Right there we go. So, yeah, um, but yeah, anyway, it's you know, as I understand it, they are in seasonally depending on who's accessing what, you know, beyond the area. Right. Yeah. So I'm 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 guessing. So that's one of the ones that I mean I. I believe I, I, the Kobe Cantishna Trail, well, I mean, so anyway, the Rex to the Kobe Cantishna is generally a pretty good bet that anyway it's in there, at least pretty close to the area problem. So, um, all right, so it's limited fire management option. So this is the least priority for going out and fighting fires in the area. So um, if you build a cabin, you know, pay attention to that fire wise and create the defensible space. If you can, again, I'm just going to put in a plug for it for anybody. Uh, if you create the defensible space, if there's firefighters in the area, you have a much better chance that they are going to drop in and try and defend your structure if you give them the chance to do so. Uh, as fire manager, it's with our sorry, game manager unit 20C. This is within the Denali borough, currently no uh, zoning or taxes you know, on there, but it's within the borough, um, which actually, incidentally, in this case, they are the planning authority, so we will be required to go through their planning process. They already have preliminary plat approval for this uh, offering, but uh, we basically need to submit the final location of all the resources, give that to them, they need to move it through the process. So actually we'll step it. Um, there is a number of private properties up on the north end um, of the staking area. And so just I'll refer to that uh, information that's on the area specific uh, area specific information on the staking web page. And we have all the survey plats. Uh, some of them could be good reference points, you know, for you. You might want to avoid some of it. Depends on what you want to stake and how you want to do it. Um, there are a couple of specific staking uh, Requirements in this one, there's a 100 foot building setback from the ordinary hot water mark of Bear Paw River. Um, and uh, and then there's also a 50 foot building setback from everything else. So the Bear Paw River being anonymous has 100 foot, the rest of it is 50. Um, and then there's a 50 foot staking setback from the center line of both of those RSPs, uh, which are incidentally, it's a 100 foot easement on there. So basically, uh, so you can stake right up to the edge of that easement, 50 feet away. 
Um, and, so, and since both of those, or since the uh, the building setback for the bear paw and the uh, staking, or sorry, the staking setback for the bear paw and the staking setback for the two trails, the setbacks would either be have to be up to the setback or 330 feet away from it. So, um, all right, that's pretty much all we got for all month. Yeah. So you're saying we can have right up on bear paw. No, 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 no. Okay, so, uh, so, so the, uh, so it is a, so there's two different flavors. There's a staking setback and a building setback. So on a staking setback, then you don't own up to whatever that feature is, right? So for the Bear Paw River, there's a 100 foot staking setback. So your parcel begins 100 feet up there. So, you, so there's a 100 foot strip of state of land between you and the Bear Paw River. Um, for any other public water bodies in the area, well, sorry, I'm sorry, any of the, uh, yeah, I guess any other public water bodies within the area, there's a 50 foot building setback. So in that case, you own all the way up to the where you have water, but you cannot build within that first building. Um, yeah, and then the, the, for the uh, RSPs, you, you have to stay, so your property boundary ends 50 feet from the tree. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. All right. So, any any other questions on all the lakes? Anybody online? Okay. So, on the Mount Rich Edition. Um, all right. So, primary access, uh, you know, is by float uh, or snow machine during the winter time. Uh, there's there's a lot of wet area in between, so I'm not going to you know weigh in on access outside of that. You know, winter time access to the area. So. Uh, limited fire management options. So again, you know, it's your job to create that defensible space. Uh, game unit management unit 19C, and it's unorganized or no tax, no zoning, and we have to the class on that. One. Um, so there, there's a number of private properties within there. So again, reference the uh, area specific information on the on the website, uh, and that can also help you identify reference points. Uh, what the reference point up, uh, staking in the city of Montana. So there is a 200 foot staking setback on the east bank of the South Fork Cuscoquit River and 100 foot on the west bank. Um, and somebody asked me this before, I don't recall exactly why. If you want to know why, I can find out that information, get back to you, but you're going to have to ask me uh, for it because I, I don't recall exactly what their reason was. Um, there is a 100 foot staking setback on both sides of the Harper River um, and then 200 foot staking setback on both sides of the, uh, of the Iditarod Historic Trail. Um, and then 300 foot from the, uh, there's a trespass uh, structure down there on the southern end. So all of those are staking setbacks. So that means that you, again, have to stake right up to the edge of that setback or 330 feet away. Um, any questions on any of those? Okay, I um, mean, that's that's pretty much all we got. Oh, there is, uh, there's reserved area incidentally. Uh, Within there, we're gonna, when we update the uh, boundary coordinate diagram on this one, we're gonna be getting coordinates for that. Uh, for that reserved area as well. So check back in if you're planning on staking somewhere in the vicinity of that reserved area. Um, and then again, with reserved areas, there's no requirement to be up to or 330 feet away from it as long as you're not with it. All right, well, that's pretty much all we have for the entirety of this presentation. Does anybody have any, uh, any questions? Any comments at all? You know, in, in years past, we had a staking or we had a, a workshop, like post workshop questionnaire, ask for feedback. We forgot to do that. So I'm just going to naturally assume that everybody thought that I have the most beautiful soldier building ever. <laughs> and it was a fantastic job. So, <laughs> yes, sir. Right, right. So, how do you guys handle that? Well, it, it depends on where you stake as to how bad it is, right? So, right. I mean, it, it, it could all the trees. Right. Because I mean, the access to the summer would be possible. So, it's a really big agent. Right. So, right. So, so, so the deal is, I mean, so if you're going to be going to, um, so it, it all depends on where, uh, where you're at, right? So, if you're looking at something that, I mean, if it's, it's if you're going through, through stands, there's probably not going to be a huge amount of underbrush. It's not going to be a big thing. If you're going through there, if you're limiting out the trees and you're flagging the trees, and it's obvious that you have a nice, you know, reasonably well brushed line, you know, cutting out. I mean, most if your stuff is smaller than four inches, you cut that out, leave the bigger stuff in there. 
that's probably fine. We don't you don't need to mow it, you know, but anything like that. Right. Where it where it becomes a problem is when it goes to things like alders, you know, where you really need to clear that out to get the line of sight. Um, you know, but with all the snow, that's going to be the more challenging part. That's going to test the ground. Yeah, right. And, you or I don't know. Right, but I mean, but realistically, I mean, if if it's pretty open here right now, and I mean, yeah, if if you're clearing out the saplings, the small stuff, you got you know line of sight pretty well. If you do a good job brushing flag and all that, I mean, I don't know, Justin, you might have some you know something to add on it, but as long as it's not like thick, really brushy stuff, I mean, you're probably fine if you get. Like a couple saplings that are knee high still. Oh, okay. well, I think, like, obviously, you want to get uh, these pictures of that stuff, but probably the more important thing on the internet is if someone comes along and they they can tell that there's a set of plan there, it's it's obvious and evident, um, then they won't accidentally stake across the parking lot. That's, and we don't really have, we didn't have any conflicts like that, but that is something that has happened where someone didn't realize someone. And state the parcel, but they didn't really put good flagging and so it was we were able to sort it out and wasn't really a problem. And so you want to make sure that when people come across your parcel, they go, Oh yeah, this is the parcel. Right. Well, and my concern is when we back out I understand. And yep. there won't be any diagram or like I'm like click it. So it's really a question of right. Making one, I get sent back out. Right. I mean, you know what I mean? yeah. If, if, right. If you're if you're that constricted, I mean, you know, do your best. I mean, overbrush, overflag. You know, just make sure that whatever you do is very visible. You know, I mean, it's yeah, it's very visible. It's cleared out. It's it's obvious. <laughs> so. One other thing that I, I failed to add in here, I, I don't think I did anyway, is uh, so long you know, for, if you're staking something along a setback. So like, I mean, if it's, I mean, not something like that, you know, big setback from the LA Highway or something, but um, which I mean, could on that one too. But um, if you got like a hundred foot setback from the river, or 50 foot, you know, from the trail or something like that, it's a good idea to actually, I mean, as much as your parcel boundary begins 50 feet back from whatever there's 100 feet back, just if you put some flagging along the trail in that section, along the river in that section, just to notify people that, hey, there's a parcel back in yonder. You know, I mean, that, that can be helpful. Anyway, I, I should have put in that plug. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions that anybody has? The uh, shape file be helpful. Absolutely. Yeah, it, yeah, if you've got it, I mean, yeah, any any information like that would be great. Yeah. That's true. Right. A lot easier to plug right in. Yeah, because that's kind of what I do. I get like, some coordinates to make sure that the loop bounds. All right, so um, as promised, what I'm going to do here, let me. All right. So I'm going to open up. Um, here real quick, Alaska Mapper, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show you just I'm gonna show you some of the tools on here, uh, real briefly. Um, all right, so this is the uh, the DNR website, uh, you know, State of Alaska DNR website. Uh, so you can go to this dnr.alaska.gov to get here, or you could just probably Google, um, or excuse me, you can search engine, um, a uh, <laughs> uh, Alaska DNR, something like that. Um, so over here on this research tab, uh, select research and Alaska Mapper. So um, on that, that research tab, there's a lot of other stuff that gives you information about uh, you know, various things, generally things that have been authorized on state land or you know, surveys that are completed, things like that. Um, you can dig through there at your leisure, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna show you this here real briefly. Um, go to a launch Alaska mapper, and there's gonna be a couple of options for which map we want. The, the most important one here is gonna be the land estate map. Uh, that's going to show the one that has any uh, authorizations on state land, such as lands that we've sold, lands that are currently under lease, permit, uh, things like that. Um, so I'm going to go to that one. The, just so you know, the base map is just, I mean, there's very little information on that. Uh, mineral estate, so that's for mining claims, things like that. Um, ownership is very basic ownership information. Service classification primarily relates to our area plans. And then the water estate is for things like water rights, temporary water use authorizations, et cetera. 
So I'm going to go to land estate map here and I'm going to go to these layers and I'm going to first off turn pretty much everything off because that just makes it load a little bit quicker. Um, in here, I, I want to point out there's a lot of different base map uh, layers, a lot of different imagery and such. Uh, my personal favorite, at least for searching around, is this ArcGIS world imagery. It's actually pretty good imagery over most of the state. So um, I am going to, just for the sake of argument, um, I'm going to go to Silverbow. And I'm going to show you how to pull that up because there's a couple different ways to, to locate yourself there. But if you go to the brochure, um, so we were talking about that PLSS, that public land survey system um, information, and it tells you basically the township and range information. So in this case down here for Silverbow, we've got this F. 004N012W. So again, that's going to be Fairbanks Meridian, Township, 4 North, Range, 12 West. So the easiest way to get there, I mean, I think that's probably the, the easiest. So I'm going to go click on this little hourglass shape over here, or sorry, the magnifying glass shape on the left. Uh, we're going to go to PLSS, short form, and do the same, put in the same thing. So you, you don't have to put the zeros in there. So I'm going to put F. 4N12W, and I'm going to go view feature. Uh, the draw feature function just allows you to query that. Anyway, I'll show you how to do query stuff, but I'm going to pull that off there because I don't want square, but I'm going to turn back on the project area, which is going to be this land disposal other. So you might double check. I believe all of the, excuse me, within this offering, all of the, the land disposal other layer matches uh, pretty closely or precisely to the uh, uh, to the actual staking area, but just take it with a grain of salt because that might have changed these. This layer is for a slightly different purpose, um, but they should be roughly the same. So from here you can zoom in. So there's a trail that runs right through the center of the area, and so I'm going to zoom into that trail. Alright, so here's a couple little tools that you can use for doing this. So if I want to figure out, so I, you know, I want to put a uh, uh, put a parcel out here on this trail, and I don't want to have to you know drive any further than I uh, I need to to get there. So there's a 300 foot setback from the highway. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here and I'm going to measure, and um, I'm going to put yeah measurement length the standard because I am not British. I want to know what it is in feet. So I'm going to measure down here, and if you look, it's uh, what right 280. There we go. 300 feet. Right. So in here, if you look in that that blue box, in fact, here I'll show you up here, this blue box right up here, that gives you a coordinate approximately for wherever you're at. So this is not precise by any stretch, but it gives you a pretty good approximation. So if I go down here, so just from the, and this is from the edge of the, basically the edge of the pavement in this case, but um, but I'm rough, that will give me a good coordinate from where that uh, blue one's at as to roughly what 300 feet away from that trail is going to be, right? So I'm just going to plug in a spot right there. All right, so then we can kind of figure out what um, what a uh, five acre parcel would be within there. But first, um, we're going to go let's see here. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to do it this way. I'm going to go by acreage. Correct. Yes, yes. Since that's one of the ADL trails, yes, it would. Um, so anyway, I'm just going to I'm going to kind of show you how you can kind of figure out measuring uh, acreage, something like that. But before I do um, note that this uh, this right here is in a, a, a decimal degrees format, which is the same format that we gave you your coordinate, uh, your survey key coordinate diagram in. Uh, so up here you can click on this and you can swap that to degrees decimal minutes or you can swap that to degrees minutes seconds. Um, so it depend on whatever your preferred coordinate format is. You have that there. Um, the information that's coming out here is also displayed in NAD 83, uh, North American Datum 83 um, Datum. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can adjust your GPS ahead of time. It's generally synonymous with WGS 84, which is what most consumer grade GPSs go off of, and which is what Google Earth is as well. Um, all right, so we're going to kind of map out a parcel. So we're going to assume that we're going to go, I don't know, let's, fi let's figure out what 150 feet is right here, what that looks like. We're going to go length. So we're starting over here. Um, 150 foot puts us somewhere out in there, right? All right, so I'm going to go just spitballing this right now. 
So we're going to start out right about here and let's go. We're going to stake right up over here in that area. I ran out of room because I got my little window right there. All right, and that is giving it to me in square feet. Oh, come on. Ah, did I get it? I, I clicked too many times there. All right, we're going we're gonna to try this again here. Four acres. So I would clearly have to extend that a little bit to the south anyway in order to get that, uh, you know, in order to get the full five, you know, five acres out of there. But we're, we're zoomed in pretty far here anyway. Oh, actually, you know what? That's, yeah, I could, there's a staking step back from that material site there. So that parcel, yeah, it wouldn't happen anyway. I was thinking that was a parcel boundary. I was zoomed in too far. Uh, so, all right. But, uh, but at any rate, so I mean, you, you kind of get the idea. Uh, what you can do is if you kind of get, uh, you know, if, if you wanted to, map out so like say for instance there's um there's some side trails in here so say you want to come over here there um we're just going to say there's a side trail in there and i really like this area because based on the topography okay now that's making me a liar um there we go yeah all right so based on the topography this is a nice little knoll with a kind of south facing slope something like that in fact, I'm going to go um, with the imagery topo right here and see if, yeah, there we go. So that gives me, you know, the uh, the topo lines with, you know, some clarity with imagery in the background. So I'm going to, um, I decide that I want to do something right out here, kind of southwest facing, uh, or sorry, southeast facing on this knoll. I can do a polygon here, and this is just for kind of drawing it out. Um, I'm going to go over here and say stake right up next to this water body. Something like that, roughly two to one. And then I'm just going to trace over that because that polygon will stay there while I do the measurement. And so I can just kind of get my measurements based on that. We're going to do the same thing over there. Okay. Right, exactly. Okay, so clearly I missed, right? Yeah. Go back out, Oh, man. Yep. Jeez. Boomer. Right, exactly. And so once you kind of figure out exactly where it is, so you can go along here and you can kind of, you know, hover over those coordinates and you can get approximate uh, corner, coordinates for those corners where it's at. Again, whatever you do, it's whatever is in the field range, right? Anyway, so if you get out there and it turns out that this creek is not actually in that location, and I don't, yeah, that does not appear to be a public water body, so it's probably not an issue. Um, but at any rate, if it was, um, you know, if there's a, a creek or a drainage or something like that that looks like it's actually public, so 10 feet wider, wider, and we didn't um, originally determine it to be public, you know, adjust, a coordinate, uh, adjust for it when you're out in the field. Um, but yeah, whatever's in the field reigns. Um, I'm just going to show you there's a couple. We have a couple of other imagery sources on here. You know, one that tends to be pretty good is the as uh, the Bing aerial. Well, OK, uh, not here. Right, exactly. Um, and then this uh, this high resolution stuff can be pretty decent as well. But you can uh, click through here again, things like Google Earth, uh, you know, Bing Maps, uh, Google Maps, anyway, various things like that. A lot of good resources out there for imagery, collecting data in advance. And if you have any questions about any of it, come in and talk to us. So, so all right. I yeah. Don't it's, uh, oh, I, 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 you mind if I sneak around and look yeah. over here? Yeah, no oh, um, go, okay. So, on that, that little banner up there. Uh, oh, it's kind of looks like a bifold. Turn it over, yeah. Okay, so you're in ownership now. So click on here. Uh, there. And so now, so you have the, the project area, which, uh, excuse me, incidentally, the, the difference between there. The, um, the land disposal other is the project area. That's the boundary of what we use when we're authorizing it for sale. So like when we went out to public notice that, you know, told the public, hey, we're thinking about offering these areas under the public recreational cabin sites program. 
that's the boundary that we use for that. So that's it's a separate ADL used for a different purpose, but that's what land disposal other is. Um, and then the land disposal conveyed is you know ones that have already been sold or are currently under contract for sale. And there's also land disposal available, uh, which are ones that may either be available uh, for OTC, which I don't think we have anything in, within any of these areas right now that's currently available OTC. Um, but otherwise, ones that might be coming up available in the future. So those are the ones that are going to show up in green. So you know, you might see some of those on there. Probably not within these areas, but some of them perhaps. All right. So um, does anybody have any questions about anything we've covered this far? Yes, ma'am. So when you mentioned the map before you go, as to when other people may have yep. called you and said, hey, we're staking in this area, yada, 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 which map are you that? All right, this is our super secret web page. So you have to go specifically to the URL. I recommend folks bookmarking it because uh, it's easy to find. Um, so we're just going to go here, scroll down to the bottom. And uh, so you are Silverbow. So, yep. So it is going to be this staking map right here. And so that one was last updated five days ago, basically. So, yeah, as we get, you know, I mean, if there's any changes, you know, some of the things that, you know, that might happen, we might. You know, get information about, say, for instance, a uh, water body that's on here that uh, that turns out to be a public water body we didn't realize was a public water body. Um, you know, we might put that on there. If something comes up, we find some information afterwards that there's some, you know, and there's a trespass or some important cultural site or something in there that we need to reserve. We'll stick a reserved area on there. We'll try to notify folks. But I mean, not that that these things happen often, but any updates are going to be reflected on here. And then once somebody comes in with a lease application, it usually takes some time. So it's not, you know, real time. But, you know, somebody might stake a parcel. It's usually going to take them a few days between when they stake the parcel and when they you know, uh, come in here, submit the lease application. Um, and then from there, it's, you know, it could be, you know, a couple of days, a couple of weeks before we get it on this map. But before you go out to stake, it's a good idea to come in and talk to us, you know, and, and see if there's anything out there that we know about. And we'll let you know if we do. Yeah. Right, right. I would imagine for all of us so. I'd hope so. so. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Any any other questions? When's the best time to go? Uh, whenever it's most comfortable for you. <laughs> so. I mean, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it, it, it all depends. So principally, like in all in all honesty, I mean, it is, you know, it's whatever you think you're going to be accessing or whatever it means you think you're going to be accessing it, right? So if, uh, so what area were you in? Uh, Silverbow. Silverbow, okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you think you're going to be using it primarily, like for uh, uh, for summertime access, fall access, something like that, you know, I mean, maybe, you know, so you're probably going to want to wait until you, know, you get out there to where, you know, you can see what it looks like with the uh, with snow off the ground, with the vegetation, something like that. Yeah. For folks who are going to be going out to say like all the lakes or Mount Rich, if it's going to be primarily like a wintertime snow machine kind of destination, you're probably more concerned about what the access is going to be like in the wintertime, right? So now would probably be more the time at least to go out there and look at it, if not to stake the park, right? So, I mean, you know, wintertime staking is a lot harder. It just is. Anyway, the ground's frozen, you know, it's, you know, you can't really see, you know, I mean, there's, you might not be able to tell the difference between it, whether it's nice little grassy meadow or a swampy muskegon flat spot, right? If it's flat and it's covered in snow with no vegetation on there, I'd be a little leery of it. I'll just say, <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, if, if wintertime access works for you and you can, you, know, you have means to get out there, I mean, by all means, check it out. I mean, as, as if you choose to stake then or not, it's up to you, you know? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, you know, and, and that's the thing. I mean, and it's it, it's fine. I mean, there's, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, I joke around about or we've heard the comments. Oh, yeah, you know, part of that land rush program. No, it's not a land rush. <laughs> um, OK, there was one time this was hilarious. Um, so we were out. Uh, so we had this uh, mountain lion staking area and uh, and that one was in, uh, an offering that, that opened in the fall. And we had these two stakers that were both interested in this. They're kind of this one parcel. And the, the, both of these stakers, I know one of these uh, one of these gentlemen, he's going to take a couple of parts to this program before. But he gets on the APB and they're both kind of, they're going along these parallel trails. It's just Mount Ryan, wide open, kind of rich top area. And they both look at each other 
People are kind of hunkered down on their ATVs. <laughs> and they're going to bunkers and bombing down the street on the ATVs. They're just like hammering and they crest up over there. And there's a guy camping there. <laughs> but no, anyway, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, stuff like, I mean, it very rarely ever happens. I mean, there's very few conflicts with the program. You know, most folks, I mean, I personally, I would rather that, you know, you go out there when it's comfortable, when you have the time to do it. You can take a couple of days a week to go out and stake. If you don't get it done, you know, whatever, come back in, you know, collect all your materials, whatever, go back out and finish up and do it right, right? You're much better off and try, instead of trying to rush out there and do it right away, you're better off taking the time and doing it right, right? So anyway, whatever time works for you for that. Yes. All right. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, if anybody wants, I'm gonna, I, uh, I should have done this ahead of time. I've got my cards here. I'm gonna drop a stack of different cards up here on the table. Welcome to grab some. And, you know, again, seriously, we are, you know, we're here to help. Uh, I'll drop these over here by the sign in sheet. Uh, but yeah, we're here to help. So if you have any any questions, anytime, you want to come talk about your ideas behind a parcel, we can't pre adjudicate it, but we're here to help you out. So thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate this. And uh, good luck in the staking. Thanks. All right, and for folks online, we're going to sign off. So, again, thank you very much. We appreciate it, and uh, have a good day.